Welcome back, everybody, to the Comics Aficionados, the best comic book panel that you're going to find on all the interwebs. And today I got a great panel. We're going to be talking about the, the video that Persh and I put out yesterday on the channel where we kind of talk about all the signs that we're seeing that kind of indicate uh, major changes, a, a major uh, transition going on at Marvel right now. Also, some of the information that we know. We're going to sprinkle a little bit of Disney information in there as well. And uh, we're going to see how it all goes. Of course, uh, joining the channel, our special guest, the, the man that has all the Disney information, used to work for them for, for quite a while, drawing comics uh, over on that side of the uh, of the world. Neon from Clownfish, thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me on. Well, I'm glad you could make it. Also with us today, live from Chicago, the man behind Animated Concepts, the next big independent publisher in comic books, coming up very soon, Jervain Dargan. How you doing? Doing well, Wes. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Glad to be back and looking forward to this discussion. This is going to be fun. Yes, I'm glad <laughs> to have the dude in the house. I love this shirt. Oh, yes. He abides like the rest of us. <laughs> also with us today is the curmudgeon of critical himself, the man who always wakes up on the wrong side of the bed. Oh. Or Pele, how you doing? Hurt. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. He's here and he sounds uh. as grumpy as always. And of course, the, the man who, who uh, did the video with me that we had a great discussion, uh, Perch, how you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. I'm, I'm ready to go back to bed, but I'm good. I'm very all right, good. so you were up all night drinking with, with Brian Ball on, <laughs> on YouTube. What the hell are you doing here? We had a good time. Yeah, it was a, it was a wonderful stream. Brian's a great guy, and, uh, and yeah, I'm tired. Well, hopefully, hopefully we'll, we'll wake you up with all this great information, yeah. this good feedback. And obviously, the, the co-host of the Comics Aficionados, the man who's been here by my side since day one, if, hey, he's more than the right hand, people. He's the something else. I don't even want to put it out there. It's too dirty. Doc, how you doing? I don't need to know anything about your right hand, sir. You're married. <laughs> you know you everything right about hand. my... Wait, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm doing yeah. great, Bryce. I'm doing he's not perfect. just the right hand. He's those things that Adam and Eve sells, too. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh oh, man! Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm doing great, y'all. I'm doing great. I need to go back. These are the banners that I wanted to. Obviously, we had a very good discussion on the channel yesterday with uh, Perch talking about all the changes at Marvel. There's been mass cancellations. We know that Kevin Feige was brought in. He's going to be the chief uh, creative officer over everything Marvel. We never really saw any changes at uh, Marvel Comics, really. But we knew there was something was in the works. But the pandemic kind of seems to have delayed that. It feels like we're starting to have some of that flow in here, uh, as well as a few other mitigating factors. And this is some of the feedback I got. This is one of the, the feedback I got from AL, who I believe is in the comments section right now. And he said, oh. Clownfish TV have had some interesting takes in the comic book industry. I've been a Marvel fan since I was a little kid, but they've been making baffling decisions that I can't get behind. All right, Clownfish, what is your your take bit on Marvel Comics as far as their future in the industry or what kind of evolution they're going through right now? Oh, geez. Yeah, no pressure. Uh, no pressure. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I worked on I worked on Disney Comics uh, for a number of years. And, you know, the thing about Marvel that's that's different from everything else that Disney does in regards to comics is that they, they do everything in house. Disney usually jobs its comics out to other publishers. Uh, they they license them out, and now I had heard this is old information, but two or three years ago that they were looking to do the same thing with Marvel Comics, that they were going to find a publisher, that they were going to try to outsource that because Disney doesn't want to be bothered, you know, running a comic book company. It's same with video games; they had uh, you know successful uh, video game developers, publishers, Disney Interactive, and they just pull the plug because they're like, yeah, it's profitable, but it's not profitable enough. And, you know, you got to think about the rent in New York and all these staffers you got to pay. Why not let somebody pay us um, to, to publish a comics? And that, as of two years ago, was still kind of the long term plan. Now, whether or not the pandemic has has sped that plan up, I don't know. Um, I think, you know, I was talking to Perch last time I was on that, you know, IDW looked like a good candidate and then they dropped the ball and they're burning down, too. So. I don't know if they're canceling a bunch of books that tells me that, uh, you know, comics is no longer a focus for them. And with Disney being in the financial trouble that they're in, it's something that they could cut loose very easily. Like it's not going to make any difference to the bottom line at Disney if they stop publishing superhero comics. Yeah. 
I mean, honestly, it certainly won't save any money either, though. Yeah. No, not a whole lot. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it cuts both ways, and it's it's one of those cases where we we can see that uh, change is coming. I, I think that that's one thing probably everybody can agree with. Um, there there there's all the signs that change is coming. The question is what that change looks like. I, I think that Marvel is this this fascinating little beast for Disney, and that it it does not cost them a lot to make. It doesn't make them a lot, and so it sits in this this weird in between state. Um, and and to your point. Uh, Disney does tend to to move out things that are not their core business, mm -hmm. but they also tend to move very slow when it's not, you know, when it, when it doesn't impact their financials one way or another. They tend to to delay those decisions, and and I think that's what's been going on with Marvel. It's they've been stuck in a we really don't know what to do with this. It's really not ours, um, but at the same time, it, it really isn't causing us much fuss. So you know, it, it plunks along. Yeah, because for the most part, you know. Marvel comics are essentially a rounding error on Disney's, you know, <laughs> financial chart. Mm -hmm. They are. I mean, they really are. The, the, their whole, all of Marvel's business is essentially a rounding error. I mean, at least on the yeah. comic side. Except the, yeah. except the MCU. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you're right. <clears throat> well, Marvel so, Studios is its own thing. Yeah. 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 Marvel, but Marvel Studios has been its own thing since forever. Um, five years it's like twelve years. Yeah, for, since they started it, it's been its own right. thing. Um, and, and then they spun off TV and everything else into another division as well. So no, I mean, but Marvel Comics just just the comic side, it's a rounding error for Disney. But doesn't doesn't Feige run it all now? He does. They, yeah. but, he does. but yeah. it was just Ike running it for a long time yeah and then ike running half of it and kevin getting um movies and now kevin gets everything and ike just sits on the board yeah well i, I mean ike still has some influence i i, I don't think it's oh, yeah. really a board position um i but i think at the same time oh, we got somebody dropped uh, it's it's a case it's a case where you know Feige coming in charge of that division was really a sign that they wanted to make sure that those efforts were aligned. The the thing to watch out for is that Feige is is not in charge or has no control over the licensing coming out of the MCU. So the one kind of counter argument to all this was uh, you would think and I would expect that Marvel uh, Comics would ultimately be kind of licensed out, uh, like Keenan talked about around uh, just how they're going to handle that property. And the fact that that's not uh, that that comics piece that that licensing piece is not under Feige is kind of an oddball piece to all this whole story. But regardless of all that, um, it seems apparent to me that they, they get changes coming. It's what that change looks like. And and we talked about the cancellations when he came in here. I mean, the funny thing is, I I agree with them canceling a lot of books. They have way too many. Their flood the shelf strategy is not a good strategy. So them canceling books is is not bad news. It's it's more kind of how it's being done and how it's rolling out that raises some eyebrows. Yeah, I've, I've, the, the impression that I get from the people that I've contacted is that if you're not if you're not going to if you're not going to move the needle for them, that you're gone. You're just gone, and uh, that's not just your book is gone. You as a creator are gone. So I mean, this is this is. And and that's probably what seventy five percent of the creators that, that Marvel has now. You know what's interesting, Perch, is we've seen all this change. We saw basically um, DC Comics up and leave Diamond uh, distributors, kind of high and dry. And obviously, Mar Marvel's their huge cash cow right now. What if they drop like forty or fifty percent of all their comics that they're generating? Like, is this gonna like bounce D uh, Diamond out? Or are they gonna have to like? shrink their whole company because you know they, they're gonna end up losing 50 or 60 percent of their total product well i mean it, it depends on what's cut but yeah, i mean diamond is a whole other i mean that's this it's just a whole other problem they really <laughs> screw them over just as much as dc did kind of yeah i mean it, it, you know you could argue that that marvel kind of with the way they bounce things around and how titles get solicited and canceled is unhealthy for for diamond anyway i mean you look at black cat a series that sold the number one issue because of being propped up and variants and everything else sold a really, really strong number one issue and then quickly dropped and now is canceled. Yep. And that that whole flow of how comics are is not healthy for, for Diamond. That that kind of up and down numbers. I mean, Marvel's been unhealthy for Diamond for quite a long time. 
uh, whatever moves they make. I mean, uh, who knows? But uh, it, it's it, it is. A, I think it, it's it, when I we tried to describe as we did this in your video. It's it's changes coming now. I can't you can't predict yet whether or not this is going to wind up being better or worse. I think one thing that I would say pretty firmly is that Marvel's not going to just vanish. It's not like they're not going to close the doors and there will be no more Marvel comics and we won't be able to read any of that. That's, that's not happening. And if people say things like that, it's crazy, but there is some level of change and it's just, it's just hard to pinpoint how it's going to go. It's just, it's clear things are not going to be the same way in a year. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with yeah, I agree with yeah. that. I mean, one of the comments from the YouTube video was about this constant doom singing and I agree with that. I, I, Marvel's not going anywhere. It's just a question of, as purchase saying, change is coming, but is it going to lead to growth? And that's the that's, problem. It, it's a, it, The industry is very mature. They're not doing anything that is basically going to grow the audience, anything along, along those lines. Yesterday, I was in a conversation um, talking about financing. And basically, the whole conversation when it came to comics was, it was just like, isn't that an old thing? Are they still making those? Um, how do it, it's it, it it is as Wes had mentioned in one of his prior videos. It's a very niche industry, and it's and it's a niche industry. Um, at this point, we almost have to say by design. And unless yeah. the, unless whoever's going to do something is going to do something that's actually going to go after actually expanding the industry, you know, Marvel will get his groove back in about a year or two. This will all be forgotten, and then maybe DC will be the one we're talking about is in trouble, but. Yeah, it's just a question of what are they going to do that's going to lead to growth. That's what yeah, one of my one yeah. of my top whales who uh, buy who at one time bought everything Marvel. I mean, incentives, everything. You know, he just he just has a simple question for me. He goes, "Well, are are they woke? Because if they're woke, I'm not I'm still not buying." You know, and it's like you know, and that's five hundred dollars a week. And it's like, well, yeah, it's woke. You know, nope, not interested. And that is more and more and more the, you know, they'll, they'll start succeeding when they, when they drop the extreme ideological bin and, you know, yep. they're just going to keep that. failing until they do that. Yep. Well, I think pricing has a lot to do with, well, obviously we talked about that last week, but by all indications, you know, neon is that Marvel's right now, they're basically a $4 comic book for regular, but it, they're transitioning over to a $5 20 to 24 page comic book being kind of what, like their yeah their core product it's, it's insanity you have yeah. kids i got kids i don't i'm not gonna give my five-year-old a, a five dollar 20 page comic it's not a whole story Nuts. yeah i don't understand i mean I, I get the printing costs have gone up they haven't gone up that much not when you're dealing with you know uh, the quantity that a company like like marvel prints but you look at a five dollar floppy comic versus a ten dollar manga you know, which is, which is the better deal. And kids are, kids are reading the manga. They're reading the graphic novels, you know, and plus parents are probably more willing to spend. I mean, 10 bucks, here you go. Here's 150, 200 pages. You know, knock yourself out. Or yep. you can go get a big thing at Dog Man or something like that. Yeah, about yeah. the same price. Or you can go get Shonen Jump. Yeah. And you can find those at a uh, lot of those at Walmart, you know, at bookstores, it's comics. You have to track them down. You have to go to a specialty shop and you got to pay through the nose for them. It's become very yeah. niche. Well, it's like back issues right now. I mean, back issues have never been stronger than they are right now. And the, I cannot, if I knew of a way to keep my back issue bins stocked, you know, I, uh, God, some, God help me. Somebody should, should finally tell me because the 50 cent and dollar bins, you know, get wrecked, absolutely wrecked every single week. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's Micronauts, ROM, Red Sonia. Hmm. You know, it's like mm -hmm. it flies out of the store and, you know, 50 cent dollar. People love it. You know, yeah. kids, kids are yep. lining up. People leave with short boxes full of them. And it's like, you know, it's a struggle, but that sells. And it's, it's a and it sells. It sells because it's a good product. It keeps people entertained. And it was during a time when people when the sensibilities weren't so incredibly skewed. Well, it's, it's a good value prospect, yeah. whereas current comics are not. Um, you know, for the cost of a your pull list every week, you can go buy an Xbox game and have 50 times the amount of entertainment. Yeah. Well, somebody's asking, what, what titles are hot and back issue? Everything. 
is unless it's like my little pony and you know like marvel starline is kind of a little bit down right now uh except unless it's thundercats uh and uh you know Muppet babies i think for some god awful reason but uh there's a there's some i mean s titles like that you know the preteen stuff like that just isn't doing very well but the uh just about everything else especially 70s and 80s you know mm -hmm. everything from 20 cents you know old beat up old beat up horror titles you know 20 25 cents you know house of mysteries and stuff like that you know they're in the two dollar bin and they sell so damn fast that it make your head spin you know and all right covers uh, barely hanging on so everything's selling right now all right Bailey. so I, I gotta cut in here i want to say thank you very much to federico de la casa with the five euro super chat uh hi guys i'm listening to you while chatting myself up in the gym I think Marvel should move back to have a top limit like the 20 titles they did during the shooter era. I think that would be smart. It would help their mm -hmm. bottom line. And, and really, Perch, if they want a lower cost, they need more volume per, per title or skew that they're, they're, uh, they're delivering, right? So if they, if they, if they cut off the, the fat on the bottom, that's probably costing them a lot to produce because they're not uh, producing and selling enough of those lower tiers. And it's, it's really it, – it ends up costing you a lot more to end up producing everything, right? Well, yeah, and it, I mean, it's it's not even just the cost; it's it's the marketing, it's the attention. So there's a, a you know some articles I've been reading of, of people are you know the average new comic buyer is buying twelve comics a month. I don't know where that stat is exactly coming from, but some people put it together and said, okay, twelve comics a month people are buying. If you're Marvel, you're trying to get all those dollars. Your goal is to get consistently that twelve comics and and hopefully grow it. If you're producing eighty comics a month. Your marketing is all over the place. You, who, where are you going to put attention to? I mean, take for example this J.J. Uh, Abrams and Son Spider-Man comic that was going to sell a whole bunch of money. They did a marketing push for the number one issue, and then nothing. It just vanished off the map for this, the the next this two, three, and four. I mean, they just they put no time into it, and that's every one of their comics. They so when you have eighty books, what are you pushing? What are you marketing? What are you promoting to your customers? There's no plan. And so when you look at all this news and everything else going on, um, you can see, I mean, I can see plenty of ways where change for Marvel would be awesome, would be great. I mean, the, you know, fewer titles, better marketing on those titles, um, maybe the money allocated to different ways, where you're hiring a better creative team for the books you are publishing. It sounds all good to me. There's, there's lots of ways that these changes can, can be great. Um, and of course, there's there's ways where, you know, they do the opposite of that. It's, that's why we're trying to figure out what's going to go on here. But I'm totally agree with uh, Federico. So th hey, thanks for the super chat. And second, you're, you're absolutely right. I think less titles. Now, 20 may be a little too less, but 80 is way too much. So for the, the point of, of Flood the Shelf was it was it just so they could maintain their market shared lead or dominance, you know, in the eyes of Disney? Um, to push DC off the board. I, I'm of the opinion it was just throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what stuck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it, it just never made sense. Like, you have all these titles. You can't market any of them enough. Plus, you also are, are kind of pushing out the independent creators on the smaller um, publishers that, that kind of feed in the new writers and creators into Marvel. Also bring different... Uh, customers in you know they have a different niche audience to kind of bring them in see your comic and stuff like that it, it just feels like there's so much signal to noise that it's hard to, to actually see what the cream of the crop is anymore like do you ever see marvel comics like market or promote daredevil like their best comic book with, with some <laughs> of the best yeah, absolutely not yeah i haven't seen it I mean, yeah. you know, to, to the point some of the guys are making i mean paley made an excellent point about you know when you have like casual consumers using a word like sensibility when it comes to comics. That just tells you how far off the track they are. That means everybody just understands that the kind of content that they're putting out is not anything anybody wants to read. I mean, right now, I'm the hugest fan of Skybound with this Firepower series, and I haven't even read the, the books yet, simply because they put out 153 pages at 9.99, and I'm like, I'm buying that. I'm, buy I'm sampling that simply because you're giving me a buttload of content for a reasonable price and I've already put it on my pull list and I haven't put I haven't had a pull list in years and it's because these guys are just doing everything is 
bass ackwards. It probably is 100 percent about the back issue. I'm one. Of, I'm one of those marks for that one. I've been running through buying back issues from the 70s, 80s at two dollars a pop for the last few months, if not the last couple of years. I just ended up doing a nom run as I just wanted to see some good Michael Golden art. I didn't care where I got it from, but just just give me something because the, this uh, this five dollar strategy that Marvel's coming in with right now, where now we've gotten to the point in the industry where the mainstream guy with one of their biggest titles featuring their biggest character brands is actually charging a buck more than the independents. Okay. I, I yeah. love to see how this is going to work a year from now. <laughs> yeah. But, and right now, I mean, I, I, I guarantee you this time next year, you won't find a three ninety nine book. Everything will be four ninety nine. dollars well, Bond's two ninety nine. Maybe. It'll I mean, be I'm talking about, I'm talking about big two. You know, it's yeah. going to be it's going to be that way, and DC will hold it. But you're right about Marvel. I think DC will hold three ninety nine. I'm uh, I don't know. I'm yeah. kind of yeah. Hopefully, uh, they, they change slower, and I, I think. But Marvel's clearly going that direction, and 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 I think they're they're peeling off right now. And this is where I think again the strategy is being stretched, and it's going to change. Their their market is just to appeal to kind of a fairly small group of niche comic collectors. Um, you know, get get minor sales, really try and land that twenty thousand copies a month uh, projection, and 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 roll with it. But it's just, it's not sustainable. I think part of what Marvel's been hoping is that they'll roll out one of these new characters, these new titles. It'll be a shock hit. It'll be something for them, like Miss Marvel was at the beginning, and they'll say, okay, look, we put very little money into it. We got a surprising return. We played safe, you know, safe stock market <laughs> for, to, for lack of a better word. And look, it worked. And now we have an IP that we can take to, to movies and yep. other things. And that's our plan. But it just that it doesn't really it's, it's not paying off. The, the, the successes are nowhere close to where they need to be. Well, that's so how we do. I'm sorry. We do have a $4.99 uh, pound super chat from Mark Littlewood. They need to reboot again and build a comic series very tightly around the MCU. And they need to tap into millions of MCU fans to grow their audience. Well, that would be the hope, I, I think, Neon, that they would hope that the, the interest generated by the MCU would kind of trickle down to the comic books and, and kind of create a boom. But it doesn't feel like they've been able to capitalize on it. Do you think they should reboot with a focus on the MCU, the MCU characterizations, and, and even visuals, like kind of the way that the characters look there, and, and see if maybe they can bring that audience back, or is it too late? I, I think it's too late. I think they had a window of opportunity and that's, that's, you know, kind of what I think kicked off the, uh, the more recent decline of Marvel was like, you had, you know, the marketing of the MCU, you had those movies being the most successful out there. And then you like change the entire roster of your core characters at the same time, you've got everybody going to Avengers movies. You know, that was just completely mind blowing because, you know, Disney is all about brand synergy and they would you would think that like with OK, with Endgame coming out and the build up to that, that it'd be like, make sure that Thor is Thor, you know, when this movie drops, because we, we want people to buy Thor comic books, too. And that's that's not what they did. They're like, no, nah, we're just going to we're just going to swap everybody out. You know, so they had an opportunity yeah. and, and now the interest in the MCU, honestly, is on the decline. A lot of people, they feel like Endgame was the end for them. It, you know, it's going to be years until we get more MCU movies after Black Widow because of the pandemic. So they had their window of opportunity. And they, they as far as that's concerned, you know, that synergy with the MCU, they blew it. They missed it. Yeah, they did. Yeah. yeah, and even if you were to do that, the, the other problem with that is because you just end up with a crisis on Infinite Earths, post-crisis yeah, yeah. situation. You need a strong editorial staff that they have right now and the structure that they have right now. <laughs> That's the yeah. problem. The problem is they'll start, <laughs> they'll do it after six issues. Everybody start doing the yeah. little thing, and you'll be right back where you started. Yeah, and, and, and strong editorial is absolutely not what I would use to describe anyone in Marvel's editorial office. Well, that's why we call them the Legion of Doofuses. Yeah, you get what you pay for. Yeah, <laughs> you do. You, well, you, you do. Thank you very much to Mark Littlewood for the four ninety nine uh, pound super chat. Really appreciate it. We've got Bo Brian Ball, the writer of Rags, in here for the five dollars super chat. They need to just do Marvel midgets. That should be the next big, you know, Marvel. Uh. Event, really, what do you think, Neon? Marvel midgets could it last for an entire year or two years? That is not politically correct. No, it be canceled after one issue. <laughs> they cancel that. Cancel probably. My Twitter. Find Maybe. Marvel little people and dwarves. Mm -hmm. yeah. Put it on Antarctic Press. Maybe, maybe it'll uh, work. Right. 
But I do want to say thank you very much to Brian Ball for the super <laughs> chat. I know you were on Purchase Channel all night drinking beers and and whatnot, probably some scotch. And uh, nice that you could make it. We also have a four ninety nine super chat from Ryan Wilson. It doesn't have to be a niche industry, and I agree with you right there, my friend. It is one because they refuse to make a product people want. They don't try to make it non niche. They they're they're basically niching themselves. One of them being pricing. I do think uh, lack of great storytelling and vision as far as what the characters could be, and I, I do think the the way that they market also makes them a niche product. Mm -hmm. uh, Jervain, do you see that those are kind of inhibitors to the to the product growing? Well, no, I, I, I agree a, a thousand percent with Ryan. It, it's a simple fact of the matter is is that, and it's something that Perk said earlier, um, and he said in other videos as well. There's no plan. They don't have anybody. Um, who's working there, who can look at this um, from a, I would say this from a purely business perspective about how to run these things, how to, how to produce these things, how to market them, how to get them out there. There is a way, I think there are people out there who love comics, but also have those business sensibilities. They're just not at Marvel in DC right now. And, and, even with, yeah, and even with the one person that I know who gave me a little bit of insight info about Marvel, even the Feige thing may not be, it may just result in just a different kind of a mess. Because yeah. according to what I've, I've heard, he doesn't see the prestige in something as like Marvel Comics. So this gets back into a whole nother doom singing thing that we've heard from years where it was Marvel or DC. Oh, they're just gonna license the, the, license the characters out to someone else. They're just gonna license the characters out to someone else. This person can't do this, this script, do that. But that, that running theme has always been there in each of these companies because at this point, what they're realizing is, what they should realize is, is that no one cares about these, these brands necessarily before in terms of Marvel and DC. If you look at a lot of the comments where people are talking about this, it's more, they're in love with the character brand. See, you want Marvel to succeed because you love Spider-Man. You want Marvel to succeed because you love the Hulk. You want DC to succeed because you like Superman. If somebody at, and I'm not gonna say IDW, so I say a boom, were, were published in Superman comics tomorrow and they were good, nobody would care at this point. Because yeah. Marvel and DC mm -hmm. have burned those bridges, and I would say since the 90s. Because that uh, variant cover scheme with the whole Wednesday with the pastel colors, that was such a slap in the face to both retailers and consumers because it felt like somebody was like, look guys, watch this. We're going to put out a bunch of like pale rainbow colors and they'll still buy it. Watch. Yeah. Watch them yeah. do it. Watch. Watch the completists <laughs> still yes. buy them. <laughs> yep. we, That's all. We, That's we, all it will. Uh, that are on, by well, it's a good comment from Ryan. Just uh, first, again, thanks to Super Chat. And I, I think that last part of your sentence is absolutely, uh, it is, this doesn't have to be a niche industry. And I think when we talk about this and we look at this, we like we want comics to grow. We, we I look at this very very positively. Comics have this potential. It doesn't have to be this way. So that's that's you know I think that's really well said. Uh, sorry, we have people. Oh, go ahead. Uh, hold up, guys. So if, if you're you're new to the channel, if you're you're coming by for a visit and you haven't checked out the content yet, definitely subscribe. Check out the content. You're gonna like what we got here. We got daily content regarding the comic book industry and some comic book adjacent kind of stuff. If you're enjoying the video so far and this wonderful panel that I've actually put together, I don't know why they joined me today. Give us some thumbs up. If you think we're a bunch of rubes, give us some thumbs down and let everyone know why you don't like Pele or Doc because it's going to be one of those guys. It's not going to be me or me. It'll be one of those guys. And uh, definitely thank you all for joining us very much. We're having a great lively discussion right now. And I do want to say thank you very much to Everett Todd for the $5 Super Chat. Marvel doesn't seem to know how to build relationships with not comic nerds or the general media. I, don't I would say, yes, it. that's 100% to do with, with marketing. They don't know how to get the reach beyond the audience that they already have. Uh, they have too many people that are trying to preach, too. I mean, it's, yeah. people are done with preaching. They're, they're tired of it. I'm sick well, of it. Some people just don't like the medium. It's not that they don't like the message. I mean, obviously, the friggin' movies or like the characters or anything, they, they, obviously, they like, they resonate with the characters. They. You know, like the idea, the type of stories, they just don't like the medium. I only would push back on that a, a little bit because I think if you put a book typically in front of people, they will read it. I just think they're just not going to do it the way they're selling it. I, I just, even me, when I realized when I picked up, I went ahead and bit the bullet on Empire. And, I, and it, it took me half a second to realize the books were five bucks. I just didn't realize they were five bucks. I was like, 
are these guys crazy? And even uh, one book that was highly touted, and, and I did enjoy it, the uh, Kill Lock book. It's like I liked it, but I don't know if I liked it at twenty five dollars. Basically, a pop. It, it it it's the medium of comics. The medium itself has been around way too long for people to say no one likes the medium. It's not the medium. It's the business right. around the medium. That's what the problem yeah. is. No, no, I'm not saying that nobody likes the medium. I'm saying that a yeah. lot of the people that they're trying to market to don't like the medium. Okay. Well, okay. Right well, well, I mean, they, they don't like the content either. I think it, it's a value thing. And I, I think that a lot of the people, these audiences that they're going after, um, may be there. I mean, they, 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 these groups of people are there and they do have money. The challenge is they look at it and it's kind of what Jervain just said. It's like, you know, if you're trying to market a YA audience, you're trying to open up something new, um, that group doesn't have just indiscriminate $5 sitting around to throw into something that they, they've never been, they, they've never dealt with before. I, if, you know, just think about it this way. Forget the Marvel, DC, politics, all, all the woke, not woke, all the rest. And just think of it. You're a parent. Your kid's there. They want something to entertain themselves. You can get a hardcover kind of dogman book for I don't know what six ninety nine that has you know you just look at it's got an inch thick of pages, or you've got a five dollar uh, you know twenty page thin floppy. That's just a price discussion at that point. It has nothing to do yep. with anything else. It's just cost. It's value, and that that's the problem with the market they're trying to attack. It's hitting that. It's hitting that. Oh, but, but then you end up with brand recognition. You've, you've got a Spider-Man, and I see this all the time. Mm -hmm. You have a Spider-Man, uh, like, say, just a graphic novel, you know, like na Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man, something like that, benign, you know. And uh, that's going to – I've seen people, you know, pay double for that over some, some no-name because they're like, oh, it's Spider-Man. They're going to really like Spider-Man. And – but – you get into where it's more than double, triple, quadruple, quintuple, and it's like, uh, that's when they start backing off. So, yeah, I mean, it, there's a there's a, there's a premium there that they can kind of capitalize on, but not to the degree that they're trying to. You got it. I, I, yeah. I do want to say thank you very much, Ryan Wilson, for the four ninety nine super chat. Not trying to be mean, but I feel like a lot of people in the industry are far left nerds, and they make everything specifically for their group. No one else. Right. And that kind of goes into a, a video that you recently made, Perch, uh, kind of pointing out the issues with Marvel's diversity as far as they don't have any diversity of, of like thought as far as like everyone thinks the same way. So they're basically producing kind of the same kind of crap all across the board. And, it you know, unless you're in that group, there's not a lot of comics for you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I, and a lot of people came on to argue with me about that, but I, I do think diversity is is really important. If you have a company and you're trying to put out a product that's going to a, go to a mainstream audience, uh, diversity helps. And what I mean by diversity is you're looking at all angles of your potential audience. You're looking at, at different demographics. You're looking at different economic factors. You're looking at different locations. Diversity means all of those things. It, it you have to you have to look at it as a well-rounded. What's the marketing approach? Does the the product building approach that's going to hit the biggest possible audience? The challenge is when the comic book industry often talks about diversity, they're they're not. They're talking about a very small uh, segment of of what they're trying to do, and in many cases. Even that segment is is inaccurate because they're going, they're hiring like four or five people from the same comic shop in the same town. Regardless of anything else going on, those people are coming in with the same experiences, the same background. Chances are telling the same story. It's going to be very hard for somebody who uh, is coming out of a comic shop in Chicago to market something mm -hmm. successfully to a young audience in Brazil. I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's it, that's not true diversity. So I, I said in the video, and again, a lot of people argued with me, I think diversity is very, very important. I just, yeah. it's it's not, <laughs> it's not what we're seeing. That's not the diversity that's going on. Uh, mm -hmm. See, when, when most customers think of diversity, they think of, oh, look, it's the new issue of Blue Marvel. I really like Adam Brashear. When, when, but when Marvel's people think diversity, think, they think, oh, this is, we want to push this intersectionalism. You know, no, no, that's that's not the diversity that works here, people. That what the diverse people want is they want to see themselves as comic comic characters, yes. doing heroic and, and and great things. They don't want to see this this crazy agenda. Uh, but the problem yep. is, is there's two different definitions of diversity flying around. Well, Amen. Let's, 
The only thing they care about is what the optics are on a staff photograph and yeah. the if you laid out all of their <laughs> comics what the optics would look like for how how close to the whole rainbow did you hit that's yeah. it that's all they care about it's and that's, and that's representation it's and that, incredibly and surface level and incredibly mm -hmm. shallow yep mm -hmm. so it seems I, like they they lost uh lost track of of middle america at some some point because it seems like comics today are made by portland for portland or by brooklyn for brooklyn but they're forgetting everybody else in the in the middle they always do wait you realize that you realize they actively hate most of the people that are in that middle right well right. It, and there's a belief that they don't have any money and they're not going to buy it anyway i mean there's there's kind of a dismissal uh by the way I, so uh, homer jimmy i know uh, gave a super chat thank you very much uh, no comments i'll just say your name thank you for supporting the channel at five bucks uh, very appreciated um you, you were up there and and it's great that you come in and, and join us we got more we got almost almost 250 people in the chat right now it's it's amazing yeah. you guys come in and want to listen to us talk Blow it up yep. today. Now, I do want to say thank you for Federico De La Casa for the five euro super chat. He says, here in Italy, ma manga outsells USA Comics five to one. More girls buying manga than boys. I think manga has no that manga has no continuity is a turn on for new readers. Neon, I, are you seeing that as well? I know you talk about manga here and there. Perch is obviously talking about it on his channel where you can jump into a manga that you've never read before and you can read it for five years. Yeah. yeah thing about anything else yeah and it's you know manga's i mean you want to talk about diversity uh manga is is doing it right because they're they're literally are comics for anybody um you're a 65 year old housewife guess what there's a manga for you you know 65 year old grandma there's a manga like for you. yeah like i mean anything anything and everybody and that just shows you know the japanese culture like everybody over there reads comics it's just a, a given but they're also widely available um, you know, they're printed on, on cheaper paper. So, you know, right. it's amazing. yeah, mm -hmm. you get uh, a lot of bang for your buck <laughs> and you look at the growth in, in comics and I'm watching these ICV two numbers and I, I could be mistaken, but it seems like most of the growth is in the, the manga, um, segment graphic novels. and graphic novels. So, yeah. Yeah. Cause, cause I like to actually on a question about that. Cause in terms of Italy manga, now in terms of the pricing and things along those lines and the distribution, so like price, for instance, what's the perceived value of manga compared to other entertainment experiences? Well, I mean, 10 bucks for 150, 200 pages. I mean, compare that to Marvel. What do you get? You know, 60 pages of Marvel for that now? It, it's 40, ridiculous. 40. I'm and, sorry, 40 or 50. 40, yeah. Yeah. It is. A, it's a huge price difference. And I think so, um, Federico is, is kind of hitting on it. The continuity is an interesting comment because yeah. And like Wes said, there manga has has plenty of continuity. It's just mm -hmm. it's it's marked and distributed in a way that's that you can get out you can get in. You don't you're not intimidated by it. Yeah. I had somebody show me this that uh, you know, one piece, a title I've talked about before, has what has to be, I don't know, five hundred thousand. <laughs> I'm I'm exaggerating, but just it's it's huge. You could read that thing forever. But if you're if your question is, you know, where do I start? It's incredibly easy. There's like a book with a number one on it. Yep. And, yep. and you're, you're ready to go. <laughs> it's, 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 it, and I hadn't, it hadn't really digested this until a few weeks ago that if you go to Marvel or DC, but in particularly Marvel, and you're like, I like Iron Man, go mm -hmm. to a comic shop or use book shop or somewhere else and just try and figure out where to begin. It's, it's not simple. Even, even the Marvel Masterworks and all that stuff, it's it's in there, but you have to fight and, and you have to know things about comics that you don't know if you're coming in fresh to just know yep. where do you begin. And and that's it's such an easy problem to solve. That's the crazy part. One of my mm -hmm. one of the main stumbling box blocks I've seen as far as monks, we do sell manga. Uh, one of the main stumbling blocks I've seen is people don't like the anime style art or they think the art interior art is just way too simplistic. And because they, you know, there, there are, you know, there are casualties when you're, when you're doing 150, 200 pages, yeah. you know, for that price point. And that casualty is detail and, and, and interior quality. And uh, the, uh, that's, that's, that's where I stumble. Cause I'm like, Oh, I, you know, I just don't like anime art and I don't, you know, and, and that's the way a lot of superhero <laughs> fans are. You know, they're just I, I don't like the anime yeah. art and I don't the, like, you know, the, the, the quality. So the closest yeah. I can 
get to that. It'd be like Joe. All right, guys. I want to say thank you very much for for Get Eight One Two for the ten dollars. I'm going to say it's Australian super chat. A uh, midget maybe anti PC, but I'm very excited about John Malin's little graveyard shift and uh, ash can purchase with my adult. Uh, I'm not sure what that is. Gra- graveyard shift. Graveyard shift. I'm looking forward to sharing uh, experience with the kids. A real family experience. Anybody else getting little graveyard shift? I I got little graveyard shift with the first uh, graveyard shift campaign. Yeah. It's actually really fun. Uh, I think Nerd Wonder does the art on it. Oh yes, yes, that's right. He discussed that at the beginning when he was uh, putting that out. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah it, it reminded it, me of the garbage pail kids. It, it, <laughs> yeah, as, as much as I'm not a huge. I don't know. I mean, as, as much as I'm not a huge, because um, she has a very uh, like anime manga influence style, and it, it worked very, very well for for the little graveyard shift. It was a cute little book. Wow. It was fun. And Thank she you got a really super chat. I really appreciate it for supporting the channel. It's very generous of you. Homer Jimmy did have a question. Five dollars super chat. Uh, no status quo seems to, to last at Marvel for long. How many times has Captain America been canceled and brought back? X Men have changed as well. And I do think that's a, that's another problem, Jermaine. Is we're, there's a lot of wishy washy. Mm-hmm. Oh, this is the new status quo. You know, all new, all all different X or uh, Marvel Marvel Legacy. It, it's every three years they brand it with something new, and then they just do the same stuff. Ooh, Tony Stark's dead again. Tony Stark's an alcoholic. Captain America no longer believes in America again. <laughs> The X Men oh, are being yeah. persecuted. It's they just do yeah, the same no. crap over and over with the new name, right? It's just bad yeah, no. covers. Exactly. So me and Homer Jimmy are right here on that one because I was going to at some point bring up the whole X Men thing. I mean, I had not been so excited so excited about comics when House of uh, X and Powers of Ten came out. I thought it was Division was clean. I thought it 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 brought the X Men back into the mainstream uni- Marvel universe in a way that was going to be real exciting and have potential. And then Dawn of X happened. And I just don't know what happened in between those two series and what we're getting now. It, 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 it's like the only book, only title, I guess, in the Dawn of X era that seemed to hold up to, I thought, what the potential of that was going to be was X-Men Fantastic Four. That was the mm, only one that yeah. made sense in terms of setting up that status quo and getting the X-Men away from, I don't mind the persecution thing, but I agree with, with I believe it was you and Perch who were talking about God, man, and God kills, who which which was much like the Watchmen of the X-Men universe. Everybody read that, that graphic novel and took all the wrong signals from it. But it's like House of X and Powers of Ten just brought it back to the X-Men kind of being just a superhero book again. Then as soon as they started with the curated line, it just went to H-E double hockey stick. And, and, and it's like, it's literally, you have one status quo here, then you have a total new status quo uh, three months later. I, I just don't get it. And I think this is, part of this is editorial. Part of this is, is that no one has a strong vision for much less the larger company brands, but much less the character brands. They just don't know what to do with this stuff. They just want to do what they want to do. And and at $5, I'm not going along with what you want to do. I'm going to tell you that right now. It's not going to happen. <laughs> It seems like <laughs> thank you well, very much to Homer Jimmy for the five dollars super chat. Very much appreciated. Thank you for supporting the channel. We also have Little Tortilla Boy for five dollars. Great pain, by the way. Not only are mangas diverse, but the writing ranging from character development and world building is crafted beautifully. And I think first that's one of the things the feedback that I get from a lot of people that have transitioned from American style comics over to manga is that you you get better quality writers. Plus, the writers really don't leave. Yeah, I think um, that is so a bunch of things there. I mean, definitely manga tends to keep the creative team uh, for the entire run of the story. It doesn't hop around. And that's a that's a big deal. A lot of uh, Western comics have forgot. European comics actually know this very well. They tend to keep the same, not not 100%, but they tend to keep the same creative team. Same thing in South America. It's really the U.S. where this becomes a revolving door of creators. I think that's a that's a big deal. And I think manga has a lot of different styles. You know, people will sometimes dismiss it as, you know, the big art stuff or the, sorry, the big eye uh, art. And it's, there's, there's a bunch of different styles. You can get a lot of things there. And I think the, the one other factor that, and this can be maybe a little hard to explain, is that um, the, the creators who do manga tend to have a finite story in mind. Yep. They, they may be huge. It may go on for 20 years but they tell that story and then they're done. They move on to another comic, they move on to another property. They don't feel the need to just extend it forever. 
And I think that's something in, in the West where we, in our desire to keep these properties going and going and going, they live way past their, you know, the point where people know what to do with them anymore. Like and Vin I, Diesel saying the, the Fast and the Furious was always meant to be a nine-part story. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> At least Fast and the Furious alone. <laughs> that, that's, that's why he did it. He refused to even come back after the first one until uh, he, he made a deal. <laughs> Oh, it's I supposed it was, to be a nine-part like epic story. <laughs> yeah, I, thought he, it, I thought it was hilarious. The uh, the uh, last the last film that he uh, that he signed up with, I think it was nine or whatever like that. That he uh, he went out and bought himself a three three or four million dollar Koenigsegg, which is a mm. really really expensive European supercar hypercar. And uh, his and when people found out, his his reaction was, "Well, that was that was my plan, you know, it was my my reward for nine movies." And I'm like, "Yeah, right, buddy." Sure. The only reason he <laughs> even came back is because he made a deal with Universal so that they'd produce the the other two the the other two Riddick movies. Yep. In, in yep. order, and and he made a cameo in Tokyo Drift. Drift. Yep. And would come back and maybe do other ones. Yep. Yeah. Come on, that's the only Sorry, reason. Guys, I I, I somewhat, I diverted the conversation. That's my bad. So back to the to the super chats. We do have Ryan Wilson, the four ninety nine super chat. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. New readers can't jump in and read comics. You have to find reading orders. I spend so much time looking up reading orders on a weekly basis. Pele, obviously, you are a, a comic book retailer. Do you see that when the new customers come in, they're like, "Listen, I just want to read this version of uh, this story of Hulk. Where the hell is it?" Where does it start and where does it end? Because I don't even know yes. how, to, how to get into World War Hulk and what is Planet Hulk afterwards. Yes, we we get that a lot. Uh, what we do is we categorize according to storylines. A lot of shops don't do that. We bundle. We sell like comic sets and not mm -hmm. just like, you know, like a mini series or something like that. We'll actually like, OK, here's the Dale Keown set. You know, here's the Peter David set. You know, and we'll yep. we'll bundle that together and uh, sell all the floppies, you know, in, in a set like that. Uh, a lot of shops do that. Uh, what I recommend, though, is that uh, the, the the comic wiki uh, has a really great section on that. And uh, just get it. Get your phone. Also a, a thing called page comic ready. Book reading order, right? Yep. Yeah. And get you just, in Secret Empire to tell you all the comics and what order to read them. Yep. And uh, just just take that with you to the shop, and uh, you know just just go through it and hunt, and uh, that that can be a challenge when you're going through bargain bins, especially. Uh, it kills me that shops don't do alphabetical order, do any kind of order in their bargain bins, and it drives me insane. We try to keep everything reasonably, but it's impossible, you know, because everybody stuffs everything back any which direction. But uh, but yeah, just go through with your app. And, uh, and and look through them that way. That's the best way to do it. Uh, if you have a friendly neighborhood comic shop owner or, you know, employee there, you know, they can help you just kind of, you know, tug on their T-shirt and say, you know, help me out. And uh, they'll they'll be more than had more than glad to help you. Yeah, I'm glad Planet Parenthood brought that up. Yeah, just real quick, because that, I think because I'm a hunter, I like the hunt part. But I think the fact of having that retailer there to kind of walk you through it just adds to the experience to anybody who knew who's coming into it. So, mm -hmm. because also what we do is we value add with sales and uh, mm -hmm. it's not just for our, it's not just for our benefit to make more money, you know, selling you more comics, but it's for the customer's benefit too, because it's like, well, if you like this, you'll really enjoy this. Mm -hmm. You want to sure. get, you, you, you really like this series. Well, you, you know, like see people going, I will take them fantastic Four. We get that a lot. People will say, I want a Hickman's Fantastic Four. No problem. We go and we get them. We get that for them. We say, you really want Hickman's Avengers with this mm -hmm. because all the Hickman books kind of loose, you know, loosely tie together. And, you know, just value add. Keep adding on to that. And the customer loves it. We love it. And it keeps everybody happy. All right. Thank you very much. I do want to say thank you to uh, thank you, Ryan. Also, thank you to Cliff Elor for the fourteen ninety nine super chat. It's a real value thing in marketing. If a pro's book can kill, there is no reason in hell a book with art is struggling. It's so basic. Love you. What do you think about that one, Trey? No, I think I think he's absolutely right. I mean, one of the reasons why I picked up Firepower was because um, I like um, Robert Hickman's work and I love Chris Samney's work. 
I was already in on those two. And now to get 153 pages at 9.99, and I'd heard about it um, basically, I think through your, your guys' channel and also over at Comic Tropes. And I was like, well, let me go pick that up. And I mean, really, that 9.99 price uh, hit me to the point. Where I was like, you know what? Put this, put this book on my, uh, put this book on my pull list. I'm gonna start one now. I'm gonna start one and to start with Firepower. It, it's the the perceived value of the product and the way you promote it is everything. You have to make me interested. Someone said in the comments here, they have to win us back. They're absolutely right. You have to win my my 25 to 40 to 50 to 60 to $100 a week. I'm just not giving it to you because I'm supporting a charity. I'm giving it to you because I want something that's an equal return in terms of value. And just because I don't want to um, beat up on American comics and, and with the manga thing, there is an analog for American comics and manga, which is called Dragon Ball Z. Dragon Ball, basically, some people in that crowd feel like it should have died a long time ago. But it's either they have a crowd that that's big for that or whatever. But it does. It has identifiable points in the story where you can say, "Oh, do you like this here? Check out the Cell Saga." It's a long continuity. Some people say it's long in the tooth, but it's like there's obviously an audience in Japan for that kind of long continuity thing. All of this is about marketing. All of this is about marketing and understanding who your audience is, who you're trying to sell it to why they're buying this, why they're not buying it. And I just think I just think our two market leaders, Marvel and DC, just don't give a crap. It's not that the medium sucks. They just don't care. They just don't care. It does feel like they're kind of riding out their time. I do want to say yeah. thank you very much, Cliff Elor, for the $14.99 Super Chat. Very much. Thank you, everyone, for supporting the channel. And like I said earlier, if this is your first time on Thinking Critical, you know, take a look around. You might want to subscribe to the channel. we got a lot of great comic book content. If you're enjoying the conversation, haven't given us a thumbs up, please do that. And if, if you think uh, you know some of the other panel guests besides myself aren't bringing the heat, give us a thumbs down and let us know in the comments. I wouldn't mind that either. But uh, we're definitely having a fun time here. And this is from a commenter called DC. It's a little bit longer than this, but I had to break it down so it would fit in on the, ch on the, on the screen. I know big two parent company accountants. My buddy says he's never seen so many cost of benefit projections talking about Marvel Comics or at Disney on Marvel Comics. By the way, Marvel is not losing money. Disney just wants it to be even more profitable. And uh, I think that kind of fits in to kind of what we were talking about, Perch. They are doing cost benefit projections. They're uh -huh. trying to make the Marvel lineup sleeker and more profitable and maybe you know start generating some real money. Yeah, I, I think that's, I mean, there's too many hot takes on this, like, oh my God, they're, they're losing money and people run around with their hair up. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not, it's, it's not that they're losing money. They, there's analysis that goes on here that is just wrong and things get said on, uh, you know, on streams and articles and other things that are based on kind of what I think people would like to have happen better than, you know, reality. But it's it's just yeah, Disney would like it to be more profitable. I mean, uh, it, it's it's kind of a situation where everyone's a little unhappy. The readers feel like they're paying too much; they're not getting good stories. The parent company feels like they're putting money in here and it's not providing the IP, the stories, or the cash it should provide because Disney likes those kinds of multipliers. Um, the people working in the company, I'm sure, are unhappy because they're they're making thirty thousand a year and living in New York as an editor. I mean, you know, I, I don't think anybody's like having a great time in all this. And that's where you know there. This where change needs to happen. That's where there are problems. But it's, 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 it's. In many cases, I think this whole situation has prolonged because it's not more extreme. If they were losing money hand over fist, if things were yep. truly imploding, change would be happening way faster. But it's just kind of. I think Wes was uh, started to say it there. So they're kind of it's kind of stretching out. It's limping along. Well, you know, Disney cuts divisions that aren't profitable enough i mean you look at what happened with disney infinity it was actually the top selling like toy to life game division i mean they were doing very very well with it but they took a look five years down the road and they're like yeah eventually this is going to play out and the margins really aren't there and now we're stuck with a bunch of action figures and uh let's just dip out of it um you know i mean Are those the ones that you put on the little platform they yeah yeah it, yep. it was huge back in the day and they what? literally just shut it down overnight they're like yeah, and, we're not, and the cons yeah. were, were insane with those i mean the 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 cost of the, the actually making the toys oh, yeah. was way more than they were promised it's it's I, it, you're right it wasn't profitable i don't understand why with that they never went to just dlc like why did they have to make toys for everything why don't they be like well here buy buy a pack of the incredibles for 10 bucks you know you get to play them in the game we don't need to have a figure 15 dollar toy for every freaking character in the, the movie but uh I, I think it was also they were uh, that was happening right at the time they were putting the investment into the uh, the magic band which was way over budget oh yeah yeah and so they you know there was a 
and I think they thought there would be some synergy with the toys being made and the band and the technology and, and how they'd get some cost savings that just didn't occur because of the, the left turn that the Magic Band took. Anyway, uh, sorry, we're, we're into inside Disney baseball now. Oh, no, that's a, no, I'm just saying, like, I mean, that's the thing. Like, uh, you know, Marvel, yeah, they're probably making an, uh, enough money to keep going, but, you know, at some point, Disney might just look at you like the profit the margins aren't there could we take these employees take those salaries and move them over to like disney plus or something you know and and get more return on our investment and that's the kind of stuff they look at and i, th I think marvel i mean again just my observation the last couple of years it seems like the people at marvel had to kind of do a song and a dance to to justify their continued existence at uh, disney i mean what was that thing they did uh, south by southwest where they're like comics are great look at all the movie ideas we come up with guys really we're worth keeping around and, and i think um again personal opinion i think sobolski was brought in to try to expand the market because his his forte was uh, uh i guess in asia he was you know trying to create some new characters and bring some value uh to it but it just seems like yeah they're just completely directionless at this point and uh, I, I don't know. I mean, Disney, I, I think they're going to look at it now, especially now with the pandemic and everything being pinched and be like, are they bringing it? Do they have a plan or don't they? Because if they don't, we got to we got to do what we got to do. Yeah, I don't think I don't think it's a question of people thinking Marvel and DC are losing money. I don't think that's the point. I think the point is everybody realizes they're coasting. That's what yeah. it is. Yeah. They're coasting. Yeah. And it's like and you're coasting. And it's like we're paying too much money for you to be coasting. We, we should be getting more bang for the buck than this. So, yeah. Yep. I do yeah. want to say thank you very much to Brian Ball for the $5 super chat. He says it was so they could compete with Skylanders. Yeah, I mean, it was yeah. a space we wanted to go in, this idea of physical. And, and I mean, I, I remember seeing some of the pitches for this uh, early on. It was like, look, we can have software, we can have hardware, we can have a collectible. It's, it's, it's a great... I mean, in theory, a great business. They, they, I mean, the challenges are everything we've talked about. And also, overall, um, you know, they didn't project that, that gaming and a lot of stuff was going more portable. I mean, Nintendo still is pumping out the Amiibos, but even that that business is, is sunk as well. To oh, like, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah and, the, and the Disney Infinity stuff had more of a functionality and purpose than the Amiibos did, so... Yeah, yeah. I don't even know why they make them. Yeah, it's just like a collectible <laughs> at this point. But I mean, we had a freaking we had a drawer full of those in Skylanders, and yep. then you're finding them at uh, garage sales and flea markets for like fifty cents each, a buck each. And I mean, they were not inexpensive. Fifteen dollars each. You go buy you go buy a sixty dollar game, and then to get all the character, you probably got just Disney Infinity. We probably had almost a thousand dollars sunk into that game. Sure, that's how they get you. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> nope. Wow, that's a lot of money, man. But you guys are Disney holics. All right, this is a atomic account with the five dollars super chat. What does Marvel look like a year from now in terms of content and line size? You're the consultant, so what's your top recommendation? All right, Perch, you, you know you're the you you brought the heat on the video. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I mean. In terms of line size, I think it's half the size it is now. I think that they have, um, you know, taken. I, I think they've invested some of the money they're putting into these broad titles. I think they're they're putting it into some some better talent for the core line. I think there's a recognition of what is our core line of books, who's on it, who who are we trying to market, who are we trying to do. I'd limit the, for lack of a better word, the new experiments to no more than five titles a month. And I would, uh, I would still try and preference the art there. And in terms of going to these new markets, I think it's, it's wise for them to pursue it. But I think they need to do a hard stop and reset and get those new markets. Uh, stop trying to promote to the direct comics shop, uh, the direct market, these new experiments. You need to go to, to Target or hobby, hobby stores or Walmart, wherever you happen to be. But you're, you're, you stop wasting any time trying to get these books and things out in, in the comic shop. I, I noticed that Valiant's got this... Uh, faith book uh that is a, is a novel and they're selling it to walmart and target and the reality is that book with the sales is going to outsell quite a you know what what a lot of marvel does to the direct market and the reason being it's going to a place where that book has a hope of selling if they're selling it to the direct market nobody would buy it it, it makes no sense there yep. um I, it's not going to be a bestseller in, in in walmart and target either but it's got a far better chance to succeed. So if I'm Marvel, I'm saying, okay, we're going to really look at where we're trying to ship our books. What are our core businesses? If there's a direct market, we're going to have 40 titles. They're going to be our flagship characters. You know, a few experiments to try and see if things get going, but that's what we're going to do. Streamlined book, heavy marketing, every issue, not just the first one. 
And then we're going to pick and choose two or three other markets outside of, of the direct market completely. And we're going to try and do some things there with creators and talents who are already in those spots, not try and retrofit somebody into those areas. And that that's what I would do. Well, being at oh, Marvel, cool. I mean, being Marvel, being at, I mean, Valiant being at uh, Walmart is one thing. But the problem is, is I see those books. They're sitting there. There's a lot of them sitting there. And it doesn't seem like anybody's actually buying them. And they, they're there. But how, what are they doing to actually take advantage of that and sell through? And they're not going to be there very long if they're, you know, no matter how cheap they sell them to Walmart. They're not going to be there very long if they don't sell. So they're taking up space if the, otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think that deal that, um, I, I mean, I'm looking into it, so I'll do a video on it later, that deal that, uh, I was surprised to see that Facebook there. It was just sitting on the counter. I'd seen no marketing on it. Um, but then looking into it a little bit more, there was a direct uh, marketing push to the big box stores that I didn't see, of course, because it's not I'm not that audience. So, I, of course, it was missing me. And they got some pre-sales in it. I mean, that, that thing is probably going to be one of the better <laughs> things Valiant does in this crazy, weird world. And it's purely a matter of they, they had the, the content aimed at the right place. Uh, that, yeah. That's that smart business. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> what I would recommend them do and what they will do are two wholly different things. Um, to answer his question about what does Marvel look like in terms of content and size, it's 370 books a month, all number one every single month. <laughs> um <laughs> And but what they should do is 40 books a month yeah. to the comic shop, about 10 other projects that are focused towards other non comic shop, non direct market uh, yep. audiences, and um, you know, and additionally, in that 375 that they will end up putting out, uh, 900, you know, 95 of them will be um, for people that actively hate comic books like not even yep. like it'll be for people that don't even like reading yeah <laughs> it'll be like here here's okay it's um it's 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 comic books for blind people all in braille that don't like reading that that's that's what we're aiming for <laughs> because they do stupid shit like this that doesn't make yep. any sense in any conventional <laughs> way <laughs> Wow, with so, that, so, I think it's so, time to move on to the next topic, Doc. Wait a second. This one is from Film and Page. Disney should have stepped in with Marvel years ago and cracked down on the way comic creators working for Marvel behave online before they drove away so many fans. Now, Perch, I don't know how many fans they drove away, but I think, you know, Marvel Comics probably wasn't a big priority. You had Marvel Studios blooming up or booming up. They, you know, they're trying to put out three to four movies a year. They're trying to get their streaming platform. Disney Plus was certainly a priority. Marvel Comics just does not generate enough revenue or you know, drive enough people away, I think, for them to, to be a priority, right? Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. And I think it's it's a it's it's a problem. So, I mean, it, it sounds easy. You know, hey, they should crack down this, the social media behavior and whatever else. And, and I don't I agree. Yeah, they should. Logically, the challenge is when you've got a company that's made up of independent contractors that aren't direct employees, that becomes a much more herring. Uh, you know, uh, that, that's much trickier to do. That's mm -hmm. that's that is not as simple. You, you open yourself up to a lot of liability and other problems. So that's that's where they're stuck. Um, and nope. to your point, I mean, it's just not worth it's not worth the pain of going in there, potentially messing up your independent contractor, full-time employee status with the amount of money that it brings in. It's just, it's, it's it, it, like we talked about earlier, it sits in that awkward place where it's just not, it's not worth doing. And, and I think you said something else. I know the majority of people in the chat will disagree with, and I, I, I've battled this many times. Um, it's, it's interesting. The social media behavior, um, it, it annoys people. It annoys me. I hate to see it and everything else. It's just, it's, it's if you're pointing to the things that have a direct impact on their sales, things like constant reboots, bad art, bad quality, overpriced comics tend to be a lot higher. I mean, it, it's plenty of people will say, I stop buying this comic. I, when I see somebody behaving like that, I remove it from my pull list. I'm sure that's true. And, and you're good for you. Don't spend your money where somebody's insulting you. But the, the, the fact is, you know, if you think about the whole market, social media is still a tiny part of it. 
And and it's these these high price points, bad art, random continuity, all the rest that really does have a bigger impact. Absolutely. I do want to say thank you very much to Alex Acera for the 1999 Super Chat. I'm sorry if I butchered your name. I think I probably got it pretty close to right. Uh, very generous of you. That's, that's a huge uh, uh, support for the channel. The showrunners of X-Men, I'm assuming he's meaning the, the animated series, spoke to Disney about bringing back the show. Is the future content like that as opposed to comics to turn a profit? Now, Neon, we've seen that um, older shows bringing back nostalgia to these streaming platforms is a huge draw for parents. I would oh, yeah. say Disney Plus is, is huge for kids, but they want that nostalgia factor and bringing back a true representation of like the animated X-Men series that was so huge and really changed the way a lot. Of, that's the way a lot of people see X-Men because that's when yeah. they first saw it is absolutely huge for the platform. Yeah, yeah, everybody's kind of going back to the the well, right? They were kind of strip mined in the 80s. And I just did a video the other day about Ren and Stimpy. They're bringing Ren and Stimpy back. Uh, now happy, moving, joy, joy. Yeah, right. They're moving on to the yeah. 90s now, but you can never go home again. It's never the no. same. You can't, no. you can never have powdered toast man back again. You can no. never have, you know, you can't have, you know, <laughs> God, the police. You know, you can't have stuff like that. You know, it's, it's way too sensitive of an environment and it just, mm -hmm. it just won't fly. Yeah. And look what happened with uh, Powerpuff Girls. I mean, one, it was a reboot nobody yeah. asked for, but the, the reboot Thank was you. terrible. And you don't, yep. you don't bring in the same creators. They don't have the same, you know, sense of, in, in the case of Brand Stimpy, you can't do it. Yeah. John no, Kay is like toxic right now, but he yeah. loves kids a little too much. He, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, Plus, you couldn't do a lot of the jokes today and get away with it. Not at all. Not well, at I, all. I'm concerned they're, they're talking about doing it as a more adult cartoon. Like they tried that before Ooh. and it was a disaster it lasted like three, three or four episodes. Um, I, I just, this is one of those things nobody asked for, but there are bean yep. counters. I think, um, you know, calling the shots. They're like, well, this is bankable. Remember how much Ren and Stimpy merchandise we used to move? And the same thing will happen with the Simpsons. They'll, they'll eventually, they'll pull the plug on the Simpsons because it's it's 20 years past its prime. They'll wait 10 or 15 years and Disney will have some brain fart and they'll be like, let's bring the Simpsons back. People mm -hmm. love the Simpsons, but let's change it all because it was really problematic. Uh, let's bring in totally different cast, totally different writers. Let's modernize totally different them. art style, totally different art style. Uh, let's I know make exactly what they'll do. Mar Bart will be Homer. Middle yeah. Bart is a middle aged man with <laughs> yeah. his children. And, it, but they'll wait, they'll, they'll have neutered Bart to the point to where he's, you know, absolutely unrecognizable. And all his, his children will tell him how terrible and awful he is and backwards. And he's a caveman. So. Yeah, yeah, it's that you can never go home. And a lot of these shows, look, they they were a product of their time. I love the original X Men. I'm going to be so disappointed if Disney, whenever they bring the X Men to the MCU, uh, if they don't don't have that team and an orchestrated version of that theme song in the the credits from the X Men cartoon, I'm going to be mm -hmm. devastated. But I know they're going to go in a totally different direction from it because it's too close to the the Fox X-Men and Disney just likes to change things just to say they did it. So yeah, um, that's how we got hot Aunt May, right? Um. Mm. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I, I love that's That to me, I, if I can loop the X-Men animated series constantly at the shop, I'll do it because yeah. it brings more it brings more feels than anything else we can show. You know, hmm. people just pile up in front of the TV and just keep watching. I, know, I just need to interject here that I really don't mind MILF Aunt May. Yep. <laughs> when we're done, I, I'm I really here. don't. <laughs> I, I, I'm okay with it. Like, no, she, she's okay, but I'm just saying, like, Disney, you know, when they brought, <laughs> they got Spider-Man in the MCU, they're like, well, this can't be the same Spider-Man we've seen twice before. So let's check. And I think they're going to do the same thing with X-Men. I think the X-Men that we're finally going to get is going to be very far removed. Charles from... Xavier walking. <laughs> yeah. Full head of hair. Logan <laughs> is full on dad Marine. It's going to be amazing. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, they'll pick the oddball. They'll pick the oddball X-Men characters like I boy or something like nobody. Oh, yeah. Nobody, oh, cares. Oh, nobody likes Glob yeah. in there, baby. Yeah. Oh, God. Glob will lead the team. Uh, oh, it, it'll I be my glob, glob, I know what say. Shark girl. Jubilee. Thank you very much to Narrow. Alex for the 1999 super chat. Very generous of you 
uh, supporting the channel. But we do have a $5 super chat from Fatal J, who's on the show from time to time. And he says, Wes wants you to stop talking so he can read this super chat. <laughs> Absolutely. It's the only way I can get Doctor to calm down you know, once he's going. I, I'll tell you what, I love Fatal J reading the super chats. That was when I was on the other day and I was just watching. He is hilarious. He needs to be on just to read super chats. <laughs> maybe maybe he'll be the super chat reader guy. He's he's there amazing. At it. He's and awesome. Thank you very much to Fatal J. So okay, literally, what was this one? Oh yeah, the, the online behavior. Neon, you know, obviously the online behavior is a problem. I'm gonna have a video that's gonna be coming up live at 5 p.m. tonight where I talk to Larry about how a lot of the comic book industry creators, there's like a no accountability. They'll never realize their part in, in a lot of the industry issues that they've been having. You know, it's always the fans. It's always the fans. Yeah. It's so weird that in today's age, I guess it's because of the connection that we have with social media where it's so easy to go and criticize people that it's so easy to just tell people to go to hell and, you know, and, and curse them out and stuff like that. But, you know, even as a YouTuber, you get it, right? Yeah. God, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. It's, it's weird because I think the... Um, the divide between because a lot of these people have been the same people for years. We just, you know, as consumers, you never saw it because social media wasn't there. I mean, the extent that most people had the contact they had with creators was you'd run in, into them at a convention, you'd read an interview in a, a magazine or something. Uh, you might run across them on message boards. You know, back in the day, there were some some personalities that were pretty caustic on message boards, but now it's like it's like everybody's got ESP. Everybody's got psychic powers. You always know what everybody is thinking 24 seven. And I think maybe we've just gotten a little, little too close for comfort. And a lot of these creators don't um, censor themselves because you know, they, I, I, I don't know what the issue is. I know working for When I worked on Disney comics, I had to sign papers basically saying, I'm not going to disparage you know, uh, Disney or customer or whatever. You can't embarrass the company. Yeah, you can't embarrass the company. Now I don't work for them, so I can just let it fly. But like, even back then, working for a licensee, I had to sign paperwork with Disney that was kind of expected. Here's how you're going to behave uh, in public. Here's the do's and don'ts. And I don't know what's up with Marvel. I don't know if some of these people well, are here. I mean, they still have the papers. I mean, even the yeah. contractors mm -hmm. get those papers. It's part of their standard kind of entry and exit agreement but um they're they, again it's they're not enforced because it's because legally going after it it's it's not worth the yeah. trouble to do it when so you're when cool. you're an activist and you feel that you're right and you feel that it's your holy mission to do certain things you you ignore the rules and that's what they do you know, they, they can't. I mean, purchase i mean but purchase right i mean having worked as an independent contractor it's like you know and i worked for the government for social security the minute they they started treating some of them like making demands on them like employees. It changed everything for everybody. You 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 can't have you can't as an independent co contractor talk to me like an employer, conduct deal with me as an employee as an employee, and not give me certain benefits or protections as a result of that. So yeah, yeah you can put stuff in there, but your hands are tied. Ultimately, it's just like with non competes. It yeah. non compete looks good on on paper with some things. But given the circumstances and situations, it's almost impossible to um, impossible to enforce a non-compete unless you're paying the person some kind of a severance package. Other than that, a judge is going to go, you can't deprive that guy from his livelihood and what he's doing. So it's 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 a mixed bag when you when you it's it's just different when you're doing independent contractors. You want them to stop acting like that? Hire them. For real. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe cross gen. I mean, I hate to say it, maybe cross gen had the right idea though. Maybe yeah, they did. Maybe they're like, yep. just, you know, we, we do our 12 to 20 books a month, but we hire yep. people, we put them on staff and, yep, right. and we also can rein them in then, you know, so we solve mm -hmm. two problems. I mean, cause Disney, look, they, they don't work with like freelance animators, you know, yep. you, you, you work on staff. So maybe, maybe cross didn't have the right idea. They just didn't have the, uh, the money to, to pull it off. It's, it's, I mean, the challenge is it's, it's like I said, it's just, there's not enough money um, to have these people come in and, and the creators don't like it either. So it's, it's this love hate relationship with the whole thing. And, and for people who are in the chat wondering, why are we talking about all this? I mean, it comes down to kind of some simple things. Um, you know, if you're an independent contractor, they don't have to pay your insurance. There is no, there is no medical, there's no dental, there's no legal, there's no any of that. No pension, and, no 401. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah, and, yep. and if you bring somebody on staff, then you, you have to, if you start treating some, an independent contractor like a full-time employee, then, and then there's been famous cases, the big tech companies lost these cases, um, which forced them to, if you have an independent contractor coming in, you basically have to, you can't let their contract extend past 18 months 
without a lot of loopholes because then you're tripping into you're treating this person like an employee, thus they're eligible for things like insurance and benefits and in, in the tech company's case, stock and other things. But on the other end of the spectrum, the creators don't want this either because they like the freedom of being able to sell commissions on the side. In some cases, it's worth more money than what they're getting by staff. And so it's 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 definitely, it's a, it's a broken system that a lot of people support, but shouldn't. That is, is I mean, and, and meanwhile, the staff jobs at Marvel, as you're hearing, you know, for all the chats talking about Heather Antos a bunch, but, you know, these people were making less than 38000 a year. I mean, it was pretty clear in that Business Insider article, they were talking about Antos in, in one case, making, I think, thirty two a, a year as an editor with no rating for three years, living in New York. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, you know, I mean, it's easy to, to say, hey, you know, kind of you get what you pay for, but it's also got to be, I mean, it's got to be frustrating. I mean, it's got to be. And, and, absolutely and you know, the only people that will actually work for that level of money, the only people that will work for that level of money and be that cheap day in and day out are people that have, you know, some type of ideological thing that they're trying to push to, because they also see it as a way to push that narrative. And they'll, wow. you know, they'll Some barely squeeze by. Break. Some people believe in paying dues. I, I, yeah, but not for five years, not for six years going. You know, I mean, these are people that have been in the industry for going on half a decade or longer, and they haven't gotten a raise. They still make barely above, you know, poverty line, and they they're just happy to do it because you know. They 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 get to talk about what they love and they get to push what they love and you know it's and that's yeah, it's all because the they just love comics cheap. that much. There is that crowd too. They do yeah. just love comics that much. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I talk, I've talked to creators who are still you know despite all they know about Marvel and DC, they they it's like if like one guy I know he says look if DC ever offered me to do a Birdman comic I'd be back there in a minute. It's like <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah it's like Nicole Coke just videos. said. You know, fanatics yeah. will work for free if you let yeah. them. Yeah, I'll give you, you know. that. Well, yeah. mm -hmm. fanatics. I mean, it's it's there are people who are true believers who are in love the industry, and yeah. and good for them. In fact, it, the world would be a much better place, his industry much better place, if those were the people in charge and and and, and in the mainstream. <laughs> they just love the industry so much. the The challenge is it's it's just not enough money. I mean, money. It, and put it this way: if you go get an assistant manager job at McDonald's, you're going to make more than an editor position at Marvel. If I mean, you, you opening, up, opening up the wallet also opens up the opportunities to people that have more talent that aren't just there for ideological reasons. Well, yeah, and I, th I think what happened with comics in general, like how things kind of came off the rails was we had you know, a lot of people leave in the 90s uh, going to movies and video games and, and industries that paid more. It's not they, that they didn't love comics, but a lot of them loved their families more and they wanted to pay yep. their bills. And that's the that's kind of why you know, I don't work in comics anymore because I'm like, I look at the amount of time for the, the page rate and I'm like, my God, I can go do a hundred other things and make more money. Um, it's actually doing a disservice to my family at this point. And that's the position I'm in. I mean, a lot of people are, you know, young and single, whatever, but I'm like, I can't literally cannot afford to work in comics for a low page rate, uh, because I am literally stealing from my family at that point. So yeah, I've always been these, a, yeah. 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 And a lot of people, they, they went to movies, you know, um, they're working on storyboards and making a lot more money. People are like, why is so-and-so not working comics? Okay. Or they just do the convention scene. They make more money just selling prints at conventions than they do doing pages, you know? All right. So we're going to get to our second to last comment. I, I'm, I'm telling you, Perch, this one, this one's going to get people outraged. And I, I don't understand it because as far as I can understand, this woman doesn't do anything good or bad. I think she just sits there. <laughs> But people hate this woman. I'm not pleased that Sana Amanat and her lifestyle brand approach to Marvel probably won't be leaving. I just want good stories. So, you know, to that effect, I probably won't care who's in charge as long as I get those from Tyler Worship. Hirsch, what is it about Sana Amanat that, that inspires so much rage? Because as far as I can understand, she literally does nothing. Good or bad. She, she triggers people like nobody's business. I mean, I, and and I'd I say Pele is itching to, to explain why, and, and he could do it. But it is... You are right. She she doesn't do much. I mean, so again, and you could say, by the way, that's horrible. She's making an executive salary. Other people are making pennies, and therefore, you know, why are we wasting the money? Okay, that's a, a fine comment. Don't it's no great. disagreement. But she's she's just she's just there. I, I mean, it's it's. I, I think that she's made some calls. She definitely have, has plastered her name onto things that arguably weren't even hers to begin with. Uh, so you could you could go after her for that. But I mean, 
in the grand scheme of things, um, there are so many kind of big problems. Sana Aminat is just, you know, I, I know a lot of people believe and, and people have done videos and there's a lot of belief that she's the, the mastermind behind all this. And I think the uh, sits in an office and doesn't do anything is a much closer take. But that's just me. So jump on in. Let's tell us why. That's well, she, great she, if you can get it. She's the she's the person that decides the 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 diversity direction of <laughs> yep. the company. And the problem with that is that the whisper network along with her will kind of squeeze the other people out. And all you end up with though is people then that Sana Aminat likes that will push what she likes, which is to push which which is that particular branch of diversity. Now, and you so you end up with an intersectional, you end up with the intersectional staff that is anything but diverse because they're all saying the same thing. They're all pushing the same agenda and they're all pushing the same characters. But they look funnily different. It's <laughs> just awful. It's absolutely terrible. And so why do we think she green lights things? Why do we think, why, why, what is it that? I thought she was like the director of character development. Yeah, she, she's not, that's not her job. That's I, not what she does, though. I mean, she she, she, right, she doesn't do anything. No, she all she does is say, I like this. I don't like that. I don't like that person. And, you know, I talked to that guy. Uh, I'll, I'll call him Al uh, that uh, worked there as a as a letterer. And he's like, she just didn't like me. She, she one day, you know, I saw her in the hallway and I said, I said, hello, Mrs. Ms. Ms. Aminat. And I was, mm -hmm. I was trying to be nice. You know, I didn't breathe in her face or anything like that. And ever since that moment on, she was on his ass. And, you know, he's a blonde haired guy, blue eyes, you know, like six foot two, six foot three, gangly fella. Oh, you're kind of like narrowing it down and, to the person here. Yeah. <laughs> and so he just, well, he doesn't work there anymore. He's long gone because he just got squeezed out. And, uh, you know, it, and that's that's particularly what happens, you know. She has a particular way that she likes it. Her favorite character is Miss Marvel. You know, it's supposed to be a representation of who she would be if she was a superhero. And uh, and God, that makes you know, sense because she's a she's a director of character development. Well, she she, she likes her self inserts. We can. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so I, I look. So again, uh, this is a tricky thing. Because I, I, if I was in charge of that company, I was in charge of the budget. I wouldn't be spending it there. Make no mistake about it. Because I, I just don't think you're getting a value on return on investment. But she has, and and I understand. I'm the unpopular guy in the room. I, I, she's got. She's she's taken on this almost mythological place within that company of being the person who's created all this stuff. And I just, I don't think she's I mean, created. I, I've talked to people she, across she the board. She endorses it. Not the case. She, she, she's not created it. it. It created itself basically when, you know, just over time, certain people or people got into certain positions and they, they helped their friends get into those positions. And then, you know, what she, she stepped in when she stepped into that particular role, whatever they want to call her, when she stepped into that particular role, you know, it just kind of clicked every, everything, you know, the, everything just kind of clicked at that point and then they had the machine that can't be stopped I, and ugh, go ahead neon oh no i was gonna say my my understanding is yeah she's she's basically the phantom menace she's um she's the one that's actually in charge she is the boss she's the big boss um even if people aren't seeing what's actually going on she's the one reporting to disney um, she's the one who, I guess, massages the data, massages the story and takes it to the mouse. And, uh, you know, look, look at the body language that that CBS uh, interview with her and CB Sobolski. She was the yeah. boss. She carries herself like the boss. She knows she's the boss. Um, and a good boss, nobody knows what they actually do. Well, <laughs> she doesn't like comic books. I'm not surprised that she can yeah. talk publicly better than CB who wants to write manga. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, again, this is just my understanding, but I, she's well, there, CB she's just wants to eat. Yeah, he, yeah, and I think he actually would have been a good choice, but I mean, immediately he he got the job and and they wow. went after his Japanese pen name, and he knew his yeah. place, and he had to to backpedal on decisions to cancel, you know, books that weren't performing, and I think that was Sana Aminat. Um, I really, I mean, that's that's my opinion, uh, yeah. but I do think she has a lot more power than people are are giving her credit for um i think she's doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes that that is actually her job is to 
to work behind the scenes on stuff that, you know, we, the comic book buyers are not seeing. And I don't know to what end I think it's to, to transition Marvel into something else, you know, that lifestyle brand or whatever, you know, Disney's grooming her for certain. They want her to be a part of big Disney. MCU wants to be a part of big Disney and Disney likes her as a role. She's considered an ambassador for meeting that niche. And again, the president's office though, the white house, but it, but if Kathleen Kennedy blew up in their face quite that bad, you know, I mean, are they do they really want to go to the well that that particular well again? But I Kathleen, mean, Kathleen Kennedy just got an extension like a year ago. Yeah, she's yeah. she's in very good standing with Disney right now. Yeah, yeah. Kathleen. That's Kennedy. not what I heard on Clownfish. Um, no, the rumor was that they were look if they get if they get rid of her, um, because there's there's supposedly. Yeah, these are rumors that there's a civil war going on here with with Lucasfilm. And again, they're rumors, but they're not going to like they're not going to throw her out on her ass. Um, They will. Disney never does that anyway. They'll be like, oh, Kathy decided to step down. We're going to have a big party for Kathy. Because look, remember, she worked on like every 80s movie you've ever seen. Star Star Wars. Yeah, I mean, they're not going to be like, get out of here, Kathy, and don't let the door hit you. No, it'll be. Kathy decided to part ways. She's going to start go start her own production company. Um, you know, da, 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 da. they'll put a good they'll put a good spin on it. But you know, the reality is, is that people are they're reacting better to the Mandalorian than they did to her sequel trilogy. And there is as you know, other YouTubers have mentioned it too. I know Doomcock has people coming to him. Um, you know, it's just there. There's definitely some tension uh, going on with Lucasfilm. You know how that ends. I have. I think she'll be gone one way or the other after next year. But they're not going to throw her out in her ass. They're going to be like, no, let's you know have a party for Kathy and remember. Here's Kathy. Kathy Kennedy's greatest hits. We're going to show all her movies from the '80s and and uh, you know she's a powerful woman woman in in Hollywood and let's give her a special award. Let's make her a Disney legend on the way out. You know, sure. let's do something like that. That's how they're going to do it. But the reality is, they're like, yeah, you know what? Um, yeah, we can't keep her on long term. <laughs> So, but she's like 70 now. So, I mean, what, I mean you've got crazy. basic, you've got the only thing that Disney's got right now going for him is Baby Yoda. I mean, yeah. as far as really <laughs> realistically, as far as what causes the real buzz, what makes people really excited is that green little shit. And I love Don't him. Ruin it. Don't ruin and, it. Uh, she, the first thing she wanted to do is she wants to ruin it. Yeah. And it's like, that's why they had to basically ban her from the production area, you know, like keep yeah. her out, yeah. keep her out of this room. Well, that's and, uh, uh, we do have to get to this super chat. I'm sorry, Kenneth Dowling. Thank you so much for the ten dollars super chat. Hi, panel. Forgive my naive, my naivete or or sounding repetitive, but Marvel has been through the fire. They went through bankruptcy and came back strong. Disney won't let the IP die. They're, they certainly won't. And I also love uh, Milf Aunt May as well. You're talking about a different Marvel. You're talking about Marvel before it was part of Disney. Yes, Marvel did go through bankruptcy and some some weird things ended up in the hands of Ike Perlmutter. But Marvel is now part of Disney. Disney manages their business differently. They, even if you're profitable, like Neon said, you have to make a certain amount of money. They don't want you just sitting there making a little bit of money. They got a big business. They want things things they're going to bring in some bang for their buck. You know, especially right now with, with the amount of money that they're losing just paying on rent and not making uh, movies going out into theaters right now. So they are absolutely in a different place today than they were when they went through bankruptcy. Yes. Okay, so I just like to push. I just like to throw a, a little bit on that because I always, when people talk about Marvel and how they came through, there's a book called Comic Wars by Dan Revive, and the thing was was that when Marvel came out of bankruptcy, they definitely changed their business strategy. They went to, they realized that they were going to make their money in licensing and merchandising. That's what it was. It, mm-hmm. They definitely were not going to focus on comic book publishing as their primary business. It's really like right now, those of us who have supported Marvel. Now we even say to some point DC, pretty much 95, post 95, we've all been in a basically one big focus group te- test market, paying for the privilege to be in that focus group and test market. That's what it is. I'd rather now at this point, if I go into a store and buy a comic book, if I pick the book up, and if I fill out a survey in the back, I should get that book for free. That's, what, that's, that's how it should work from this point on, because that's what the comic book publishing has been basically post 95. They, he lays it out in the book. They like, it's licensing and merchandising. Now in terms of them being part of Disney, I agree that this is going to say, this is your business. Is it, is it hitting the proper levels that we want? If not, I think it is not beyond their own possibility. They license the operations out to someone else and take the license and merchandise thing, but that would still line up with the business model that Marvel yeah. adopted once they came out of bankruptcy, which is licensing and merchandising. 
That's where the money is for these guys. It's not in it's not in making the donuts. It's like do I have the Dunkin' Donuts brand and can I license it to somebody else and they just pay me a, a royalty every couple of months on yep. the brand that I've built? Yeah. The DC uh, ro- or merchandising just for like lunch pails and socks exactly. is, is like two or three times bigger than the entire comic book industry. And Warner Brothers doesn't, doesn't do anything that other, other companies do all that for. <laughs> yep. So yeah, I'd say pound for pound. Great. Pound for pound uh, comics are if you had to look at the full dollar amount comics, making comics for Marvel is more trouble than it's worth. Yep. Mm -hmm. But, but, but it's also the house of ideas and they need something. They need a well to go dip from. They do. It is a cheap testing ground to see if stories are good. And I want to say thank you very much to Kenneth Dallin for the $10 super chat. Now let's get back into the controversy. Who wants to talk more about Son Amina? Who I'm convinced doesn't do anything. At least that's the way I understand (laughs) it. I think she's just a face that, that Marvel likes and uh, she presents herself well, but doesn't do much. Yeah. Uh, no, no. She does a lot. She does too much. So it's, it's just. It's, it's Wes and I versus. <laughs> I just. Well, so I'll, just, I'll just try, man. I never heard of this woman until I started watching this channel. So <laughs> it's like, I didn't realize we had Emperor Snopes or Lord to, Snopes or whatever it is in our presence. But <laughs> I can point to all the hiring decisions, the people that yeah. were, people that were. She gave the nod. All the hiring decisions at Marvel over the last five years, she was directly involved with, and those people caused the most problems, and they write the shittiest stories. She didn't have... hire Dan Slot. Yeah, I, I, that's that's no, but no, she no, no, no. I'm talking about the people that have been hired over the last five years. She didn't she hire Heather Optos. She was definitely involved in the hiring of Tanahisi Coates. Tanahisi Coates doesn't do anything. He just writes bad comics. You don't even see him online. <laughs> But that's because he, well, first of all, the only reason you don't see him online anymore is because he keeps getting owned by actual yep. black intellectuals. Yep. Mm. Okay. Yep, because Cornell cool. West keeps smoking him every time he comes. <laughs> up. He learned his lesson. He doesn't cause him any troubles other than bad comic books. Yeah, I mean, I, let, to, yeah, uh, for a while he like, did. At what point do we say, like, what, what's the duration of uh, of this? Like, like we... I just I, I want to see some some real smoke to the I, I want to see some real fire to the smoke in in all this. It just I it's all been Marvel burning big down. Movie, man. And it just it other never than she didn't hire down, Max Bemis. She no, certainly didn't of, hire Chuck Windig. They're the ones that are embarrassing the company. <laughs> yeah, but they she draws to keep them around because she's part. They're but, part of her. They're part of the disciples she, of woke. Then she's completely inept at her job because they're not around. Yeah, they got fired. Yeah, so she they has to sell, but she still keeps them around. They still get part time. They still get freelance work at Marvel. Not Marvel. Chuck Wendy not, does not. Not no, Max Bemis certainly doesn't. Disney. Well, Grace doesn't. He just did a tell all. Max Bemis just did a tell all on YouTube talking all kinds of shit on Marvel. Yeah. I. I <laughs> Well, I'm she, looking at Wendig's. I'm looking at Wendig's page, and he says he's working on a project for Marvel presently. Yeah, he's, 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 he's not updated. It. He was working on a project project two years ago when he got shit kid. Oh, Tell you're fine. People, he, okay, fine. Sana Aminat is fine. She doesn't do anything. She's no, fine. She, 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 she's fine. She's awesome. She it, has no, it, problems, it, no it, problems with her. This is what I fucking hate about this stuff. Is it? It's got to be the end of the world or happiness town. It's it's not it's not both those things. She can't be an evil mastermind or the, the savior of all of comics. It's just she's. I, she's I, mean, like, she's I never said she was a savior of all the comics. No, you just went into this. It, it's like, oh, she's, she's fine. She's amazing. It's like she is, she is a marginally inept political hire yeah. that sometimes involves herself in who makes horrible decisions and every one of her decisions that she is involved in, no matter how many, what percentage of that of the overall company are bad. That's well, the, like, one of the bad she decisions. Sets the tone. She she sets the tone. I'm assuming she had nothing to do with that one. What are the other bad decisions that Marvel's made lately that, that have lost them a lot of uh, money? Well, what, what else have we got? Um, War of the Realms was disappointing. Empire, I guess, is selling better than it was supposed to. I just don't see much with their fingerprints on it. Are they really pushing Captain or Miss Marvel right now? We don't know. Yes, we, yes they are. You're pointing at she doesn't do video this when you don't know she doesn't do that. She doesn't what? have you anything know. to do with video games, Doc. Yes, she does. Out. She's the video game guy now? No, I, she's involved in everything that... 
What? Marvel? Mar- how? How? I'm, how I'm, gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna back yeah. duck up here. Whether or not she's competent isn't the question. The the for, from what I understand, she has Disney's ear, and she's yes. whispering in their ear. Um, now I don't know if she's she's executing this stuff competently or not, but she's like, hey, you know, we need to do a little more of this, a little more of that. This character's real popular there, uh, Disney executive who doesn't read comics. Trust me, uh, Ms. Marvel is is the most popular character. Captain Marvel is the most popular character at Marvel. In fact, that's why we do all Marvel comics. And because when we're making Marvel. this Avengers video game, we need to make sure that she is central to it. I definitely think that part of her role is to, and it is the defined part of her role, is to shuttle these new properties into other markets. And I absolutely do agree. I would say that she is promoting, you know, Captain Marvel and Miss Marvel and these other things into these new markets. I, I would agree. If, if so, if that's if that's the the bad thing she's doing, then I'm with you. Thumbs up. She she is shoveling these new comics. Com- she in her head because we can we know this from her interviews that she believes that these new markets that uh, mm-hmm. the, the Marvel needs to go into will only be met by Miss Marvel, Captain Marvel, these kinds of characters. That is what she believes, and and she says it herself. And so therefore, part of her job is to take these new properties into these new markets and try and get some traction there. And I think she's doing that. I, I would agree. But I mean, the, the rest of this stuff, I just think. It gives this, it, we, whenever we talk about this stuff, it always kind of brushes aside, you know, David Gabriel, C.B. Sobolski, Joe Casada, Tom Brevoort, a bunch of other people that frankly have a lot more to do with the day-to-day clusterfuck that is Marvel. And this- all of them walk behind her, rubbing their hands together, going, yes, Miss Almanac, may I please have another? Yeah, that's no you proof. <laughs> I, 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 and there's I no even- proof there's not. I, I don't think the way she behaves with any of them else around. I, I don't just think like, that they are. I just think that you have a bunch of incompetent people. They're all doing their job poorly. They look, I mean, my opinion is they probably know if they, they piss her off, she's gonna go run to Disney and get them fired. Yeah. You know, exactly. so yeah, I mean, it might not be a case of where she has direct control, but it's understood. You don't you don't piss her off or you're going to get fired. So, yeah, they're going to be like, yes, Ms. Zamanat, what do you want? Because I need my job. I, I just don't buy it. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I've talked I, I talked to a number of people. I just I don't buy it. And there's public comments that come out that that speak otherwise. But but maybe so she could. I, I'm fine. She could be the, the puppet master behind the scenes. We're controlling everybody's job. I just I think it it uh, ignores, frankly, people with a lot worse impact that company who get a kind of run around crazy all the time well i did initiate it how how did she get the job in the first place she had no (laughs) comics experience she she came from a comic company actually Uh, yeah she did where she did jack shit and they liked her because she was a woman of color and she had drive and she spoke well to others no it actually has everything to do with the fact that disney wanted somebody that had a lot of political connections and her family had a shit ton of political connections she also happened to have comic book experience a little bit she had a little bit of comic book experience two years a lot of political connections and was also she fit literally every checkbox they wanted that's why she got the job that's it Two okay. years comics experience, and she got to be an executive at Marvel. What the hell? But Heather Antos works say, for five or six years. For the five dollars super chat. Apparently, they cover this extensively at Fourth Age uh, on YouTube, and he thinks you should go watch. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. I'm sorry, uh, Neon. I think I talked over you. Oh, no, 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 that's that's okay. I got to run anyway. But uh, yeah, I mean, interesting conversation. I think. Yeah. You know, um, Marvel. Whatever, whatever's going to happen, there's going to be a big, there's going to be a big shakeup at Marvel, and I think you're all going to see some people at the top get going. Everybody, Um, go subscribe to Clownfish TV. They are awesome. I um, love watching all their episodes. (laughs) You you really need to check them out because they, they, they do really put some really good news out. We just, uh, we just make it up as we go. That's what we do. (laughs) So that's the They're getting close to a million subscribers. No. But God, they, no. but but go over there so they can get to a million subscribers. So. Well, you're getting right. close. You're closer than you were. You're certainly closer than me or or Perch closer than I was yesterday, right? You're oh, definitely yeah. a lot closer than me. Yeah. With my life. Yeah. Congratulations yeah. on all your success. Thank you so much for joining oh, us today. No, I hey, really no appreciate yeah, your yeah, insight on Disney and Marvel with your experience. Yeah. I, re- I really thank you for for coming over. And I know you got something to do. All right. Hey. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. Yep. Hey, so we also got Federico de la Casa. With the five euro super chat, did you watch Joe Casada talk to Christopher Priest where he said, I'm not a black writer, I'm a writer? Tana Easy Coats, it's easy to write Black Panther, try Superman. 
I don't remember the part about it's easy to write Black Panther try Superman because he's failed at Black Panther seemingly. Although his beginning was interesting, he certainly changed the uh, the aesthetic along with the artist. No? Yeah, yeah, I just never got it. I never understood it. I never understood. Yeah. It. I mean, I understand it from them wanting because he was, uh, and it was an amazing turnaround on the whole reparations thing. And how they felt that that would bring in an audience for the Black Panther thing, but in terms of the character, the sensibility, the tone, it just never made sense. You know, it, it it's kind of like if if you you know, as much as I don't like to get into the woke ideological stuff, if there was ever an Exhibit A in a trial, <laughs> Coach Run of Black Panther would be it. So that's yeah, the best I can say about that. I I never liked it, but. But I do not watch the Joe Quesada stuff unless I hear something crazy happen. I'll go and watch it so I can talk about it on the channel. Otherwise, I'm not all that interested. I don't think Joe Quesada is all that interesting to me. But I do appreciate the, the super chat. And uh, thanks for bringing that up on the channel. We do have one last comment that I wanted to get to from the viewers of uh, the the Marvel video that Perch and I did together. And this is from Iron Bay Knight G. The MCU has been nothing but bad for the comic book industry. It allowed a lot more parasites to come into the industry to push their message. Perch, do you think the MCU has been bad for the for the industry? It certainly hasn't been the windfall that you would have expected it to be. Yeah, I mean it hasn't been the windfall. I, I, I agree. I agree with that. I think it's it's when people look back on this many, many years from now, I think they're going to view it as a as a kind of a radical series of missed opportunities. I think with the comics, um, I think the weird fight between Disney and Fox and what it did to those properties. Uh, I thought I mean it's you think about the damage that was actually done to things like the X-Men and the Fantastic Four, which were clocking as properties. And then this feud got going because of where the rights were owned by the studios and it just derailed the comics and they're having to almost win back that audience. I mean, Wolverine's a popular character, but he's not as popular as he was. Now, maybe that would have worn out anyway, but it, it that fight didn't help. And I think the, the failure to get the comic books aligned with the movie's success I don't mean align with the movies. The comics books shouldn't have to become the movies, but the fact that those two didn't grow together, I think mm -hmm. is probably the biggest fuck up in in uh, in this industry. And and uh, it, you know, it, it, it just think about how much different everything would be if the comics were selling three times as much as what they sell today. We'd be the having a different up. conversation. The biggest screw ups were, I want to, th oh wow, I really like the Thor movie. Can I, can can I get the new Thor comic book? Wait, wait a second. Who's this chick? You know, it, you do have to have some type of, 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 you have to have some convergence with comics and the movies. And uh, if you really wanted to, if they really wanted to maximize, you know, the potential within both. And uh, it just didn't, you know, they didn't have the anything lined up because they weren't on the same page. The comics weren't nearly, weren't anywhere on the same page as they, as, as the movies. So it was a mess. And, uh, you know, people left the store disappointed because they're like, oh, I can get the back issues, I guess, you know, and they bought the back issues and that was fine. But nothing in the new comics was anything close to what the what the movies were doing at the time. I, I think <clears throat> I think there's a, a, a different way to look at this. And that is up until the MCU, historically, if you look at comics comic movies and their impact on comics there was zero translation there was no tran there was very little translation from cartoons there was very little translation from films in drawing in new readers historically i mean if, if you if you look at it there was basically no evidence to say that movies no matter you know even as good as the first x-men and spider-man movies were that they draw brought in any new readers. Uh, same with Batman movies in the 80s. They didn't bring in 80s and 90s. They didn't bring in new readers. And I think that Marvel looked at it as, well, that's going to keep happening. So in the event that we do bring them in, let's give them what we want to give them and not what they want to get. Which is... Yep. You know, it's interesting because I think um, I think there were two things that have happened. I think if you look at the old Superman, Batman movies, the stuff that went on in the 80s, 90s, with, with well, more the 80s, with movies, there is signs that it brought over a crossover audience to comics because there was this recognition. Back, I remember seeing Batman in the theater and there being more uh, out there in the opening credits and the opening kind of line that there was a comic book, that the comic book there existed. Was, Batman sales blew up 
during the 1980 yeah. movie. It, it yep. did. It, it 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 was. It it showed a a and and meanwhile, you didn't see uh, the Batman comics, the main continuity, like change the costume around. Didn't suddenly start looking like Michael Keaton. I mean, they they were able to live in the same universe. If you went and watched the movie, you went and then bought the comic, you still felt like you were kind of getting the same thing. It didn't feel so radically different. And with with even Marvel, when oh sorry, go I ahead. Was, I was just gonna say even when even when the X Men launched, Fox launched the X Men. X Men comics exploded. It was absolutely nuts. Their sales went four and five times. They went parabolic, you know, and they stayed that way for about a year to two years after the X Men, after the first X Men movie launched. But was and that due to the the film or the fact that that's when they launched the Morrison run? That was it, it was a good. John synergy. Jackson Miller from like Comicsology told me not Comicsology Comic Con said it all has to do with there's money in the industry. He said there was a ton of money. In the industry, yep. because they hadn't had the, the bubble burst in 1989, so they were able to heavily invest in Batman books. And when people came in, they had they were flush with Batman books. But he said yeah. that's why they were able to capture the magic. He but, said if the industry doesn't have money, they can't capitalize. If you look at the 12 months before, whenever they were slapping all the uh, like with the X Men movie, whenever they slapped all that logo up in the up in the corner box, you know, the 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 from the the blockbuster movie, the X Men, blah blah blah. There was no jump in there. There was no jump. It wasn't for another six to twelve months after that. There was no. There was no sales jump. It, I think well, Miller I said that there wasn't a lot of money. That they just come off of like some type of down period. That's what he told me. Yeah, it. it I think it's. It, there, there's a bunch of reasons why the movies don't don't connect well with the comics. In, in and in many cases, it's not necessarily what the characters look like or if they've changed. It's that it's it's the, the when a movie comes out you're generating interest in a brand. And so there are people who haven't heard of the comic who now know about the brand. So they're interested to go get more things from that brand, toys, games, shirts, and comics. If you go to the comics and you have like issue number six of 12 or the story that's being presented to you is radically different than the comic. Mm -hmm. So when Captain Marvel came out, you had a movie, whether you liked that movie or not, it was you know basic popcorn action movie, she did some stuff. Meanwhile, in the comic, you have a very much a uh, slice of life kind of she's discovering that her mom is actually a Cree and there's like three issues go by with no action. It didn't feel like the movie. It was it was a completely different product. And that's that's the miss. If the comics can align even tonally with what's going on, even I would argue, although it'd be much harder to do. If you had uh, the Jane Foster Thor, if the comic was still action packed and, and had that same kind of movie feel, it would be in better shape, of course, it'd be even better if the, the main character actually kind of looked and felt like the, the character they're watching on the screen. But the problem is the story itself is, is completely different. It's like going to watch a Western movie and then the book that's attached to it is a romance. It's like it's completely different. That's, that's I mean, where the problem. Yeah, it, it, And they're going to run into that now. I don't know if they're still doing, if they're going to be still doing Jane Falls of Valkyrie, but you're going to come out with Thor, Love and Thunder and she's not even Thor anymore. It's just, yep, exactly. I mean, now it's going the other way. Exactly. Yeah, it, 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 it's like, you know, there's no attempt. I mean, when Spider Man into the Vi Spider Verse came out, I had two or three of my coworkers come up to me and ask because they knew I, w I was in the comics. Like, hey, my kid loved that movie. I'd like to get a comic for him, stuff like that. And I, re I knew there was a Spider Verse book kind of out there, but there's, there's just no, it's not even like you need a one to one, but you kind of just like, like one kind of one. To in order to, to get people into that. So, I mean, I, I take Doc's point because I think there's a number of factors of whether or not can you really say that because somebody saw the movie, they go into the comics. But I do think there's enough anecdotal evidence of people that basically have said that the reason why I started reading the comic was because I like that show or I saw that thing over there. And I think, and I agree with Perch, if, if it's so radically different from what you saw up on the screen, and, and, and in this case, it's not that the character's different. It's just, it's this really deep emotional piece where it's like Captain Marvel, because I agree, Captain Marvel's trying to figure out who her mom is in her heritage, and it's like, dude, this is not what you guys were selling me in, at AMC uh, uh, two or three weeks ago. It's, it's just, it needs to be space. just a little bit closer. Yeah, it's... Well, I, I think one of the other things to keep in mind is any impact... Okay, you said that the 89 Batman movie you know, really brought in new readers. Okay, I what... Didn't say I said it bumped up sales because oh, comic right. retailers have tons of people retailers. look for merchandise. Okay, yeah. okay, whether whether or not it was new readers or not, but the, the major difference between then and now is 
there all of those books were available every time you walked into a grocery store or a pharmacy or a 7-Eleven. Yeah, that too. And, and well, also and, the volume of superhero stuff you get in like on TV and movies was was like that was it. Lower, yes. It uh, was, you get you get it all over streaming, you get it all over television. You might not even need but, comics to keep but, up with your superhero addiction. But I guess my point there on, on that is the ease of access to new product no. versus having to go and track down a comic shop. And that's where what I'm talking about with like the X Men movies, the the Spider Man movies, and not really bringing in new readership because because none of them really translated into new ongoing readers. Very few of them. Oh, somebody was asking. Uh, wait, they're not making Jane Foster Thor in that movie. She's going to be Thor. The way I understand it, she's going to be Thor for about half of a movie. Oh, okay. and then and then that's it. Yeah, she gets the camera. She gets to fly around as Thor. I, we don't know how long, but. She gets to fly around as Thor. And then by the end of the movie, she's like, okay, she's not Thor anymore. And uh, and Hemsworth's going to be still Thor. So So we do have a $5 super chat from Atomic Hound. Thank you very much for supporting the channel. When does Marvel pull the trigger on a Star Wars Marvel Universe line-wide crossover? Not saying it's a good idea, but talk about attention. Now, Larry from Larry's Comics thought he heard a a TIE fighter in the beginning of the, the King in Black trailer that had Donnie Cates in there. He thought maybe there'd be a crossover there. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't even think we'll get a Star Wars Marvel Universe crossover. Maybe there'll be like a special like issue or two, like a, a something fun. But I do think we will see aliens and Predator in the Marvel Universe. Yeah, I would agree with you there. Yeah, I think it's just going to make it's just going to be a matter of time before those licenses expire. Hmm. Marvel, what Marvel license? will try to push to <laughs> bring those licenses back to to Marvel. They are coming back to Marvel. They're yeah, they, back they announced they're doing more. comics in, I think, November. We get our first one. Okay. Oh, really? I, I must yeah. have missed that announcement. I made a video on that. Have you been skipping out on me? me yeah, now? me too. Come on. Wait. Oh, oh wait. Bro? I put my heart and soul in actually, I Actually, I think I did read that, and I just entirely forgot it because I'm like, oh, God, Marvel's going to fuck up <laughs> the Alien and Predator franchises. No, they've certainly done nothing good for Conan, really, since they came back. A no. couple of <laughs> Except for back yeah. issue sales. Wow. Yep. Back yeah, issue sales, and uh, right now, elections. we've got uh, tremendous we've got tremendous sales right now. Aliens and Predator merchandise and, and older back issue comics are just flying. So, All right, Gervain, cool. you're, you're a product of about the same period of time I am. You've been mm-hmm. reading comics longer than I have. You've probably been watching Star Wars as long as I have been. Would you geek out over a, a, a Iron Man Star Wars crossover? Do you want to see Star Wars in the, the Marvel universe? No. <laughs> no, I, I no. It, 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 no. It, it's one thing when I mean, yeah, I am from the same era, probably a little bit older than you, and it's like I already jumped that truck with uh, Star Trek and X Men crossover. I was done what? with that kind of stuff. Star Trek Green Lantern yeah. was. Yeah, no, no, but you know, Batman, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is one thing. Like that, I geek mean, out more over. Yeah, yeah. well, Batman, part of the yeah, I mean, it was I like the artist on it and stuff like that. But it like in terms of the geek for me, like if people have ever mocked before this, I was big on the IDW, DC, IDW, Batman, TMNT stuff because oh, yeah. those were just the two big franchises I grew up on, and and that made more sense to me. Um, them both being kind of street level heroes and stuff like that. And TMNT basically being a playoff for Daredevil, then something like Star Wars, X Men. I'm just not interested in seeing Boba Fett go up against Wolverine. But I realize mm-hmm. that's some that's some people's things, but I'm not I'm not there. Yeah, I, I could pass. I just wish they Thank would you. just do really good Star Wars comics. <laughs> Thank you to Tom Account for the super chat. Thank you for supporting the channel. I guess it's time to like kind of start wrapping it up here. Let's do some comic book recommendations. We've had a good good uh, chat here today with a little bit of fire here at the end. I definitely want to say thank you to, to uh, Neon from uh, Clownfish TV for joining us. It had a, brought a lot to the mm-hmm. table. Perch, yep. I saw you get heated there. You don't normally drop F-bombs on the panel. I like I like the boxy kid. What are you recommending uh, to people this week? Um, you know, I think it's it was a, it was an oddball week. Um, there's there's stuff for, for different tastes. Um, I like the Phantom Max series. I, or sorry, not series. The uh, the one shot. I thought that was the best yeah. of the giant size as well. Um, I'm, I'm looking at it here now. I mean, it, it is funny that the big review of Empire is it's it's 
it's better than the low expectations that were set. Uh, but Maestro <laughs> is probably the thing I enjoyed most uh, this week. That's the Marvel yeah. Tales one, right? That's the collection. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's it's not new. Um, so, but it's it's George Perez. It's it's Peter David. It, it brought a lot of good memories back. So I I mean, sad. That's that's what I enjoyed uh, at the at the height. Um, I don't know. You know, DC's just doing good things over there. Um, you know, for people who like Money Shot, that's a very different kind of book. So <laughs> there's some stuff there. Uh, Ice Cream Man. I know a lot of uh, my friends are really into that. So it's, it's good stuff. There's a lot of a lot of stuff out there. Um, this was a, a week with. Uh, there's at least probably one comic that you could enjoy. I think somewhere this week. Absolutely. So I do want to say thank you for Kenneth Allen for the five dollars super chat. He said, "Before you go, I wanted to let you know I just bought X Men: Fall of the Mutants." Hopefully on Doc's recommendation, he was pushing that thing so hard. We have made a video about it. Man, great story. Love it. Have a good one, guys. Love you, man. Thank you for, for sharing that. That's a great comic book. And if you haven't read Fall of the Mutants, definitely go check that one out. You can definitely get it in, in trades. Maybe go get it in back issues. Easily Thank you so much. Easy uh, Wilson. Crossovers. With the four ninety nine dollars Super Chat. It may sound crazy, and I don't think this does sound crazy because I, I read this beforehand. But I think Batman The Adventures Continue is better than Joker War. And I think this, despite hating the cartoon art and kids' comics. Uh, you're probably right. I think Joker War is good. And this has been a high point of the series so far, or the story so far, was this week. Uh, it's, it's not a lot of great stuff going on there. But Batman The Adventures Continues. It's uh, Paul Dini do, doing some great stuff with the characters he loves. And I, I, I believe you. It probably is much better. And uh, thank you for, for sharing that one. And Deadshot Dookie, great shot, uh, great show. Love you guys. 99, 999 Super Chat. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. It's only a great show with you guys. Without everyone here having a good time and uh, and keeping the, the chats lively and, and keeping the panel honest, it would be a great show. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Birch, were you done? Yeah, I'm done. I'm good. All right, Pele, what are you recommending? Oh, you're already you're already at me. Okay, uh, this is a this is an ask, but it's a really awesome it's a really awesome trade paperback. Uh, Conan, the original Marvel's epic collection, came out. It is beautiful. It is awesome. Uh, if you love the old Conan, that is an awesome buy. Uh, also, uh, what was pretty hot? Uh, I guess I guess Star Wars number five did pretty well as far as sales. Kind of took us by surprise. Uh, I didn't get a chance to read it. Some people said it was, it was, it was, it, it, you know, it was pretty good uh, from what I understand. Uh, and uh, I'm going to push uh, Usagi Ojimbo. Uh, it was an awesome issue this week. Uh, number 11 for the bullet. It's, it's Usagi. It's great. Buy it. Oh, mic drop. All right, Jermaine, is there anything, any comic books people should be buying? Firepower. That's where I'm at right now. Firepower. I haven't read it yet, but I just like the way they rolled it out, the way they're promoting it, and I think it needs to be pushed. Another thing I would say, uh, since someone mentioned Batman the Adventures Continues, um, DC is also doing the original Batman MS series comics on um, the DC Clocks is for two bucks. If you have not read them, that's a great price and a great buy. There you go. Absolutely. And uh, certainly, if you like Robert Kirkman, you're, you're probably going to like Firepower. I haven't gotten to that one yet, but I'm looking forward to reading mm -hmm. that comic book. Doc, what do you got for people? You recommend any new comics? Please, please let me do. Uh, the only thing that came out this week that I bought was the giant sized X Men Phantom X. And you recommend it? It's a good story. I yeah, like it that. was. It's good. It's good. I, I, I do recommend it. It was easily the best of the giant sized X Men issues so far. Um, this one, I think there might be a second print coming out, but the uh, Rob Liefeld Snake Eyes Dead Game, uh, number one, if, if you can get. It, it, yeah, if you can if you can pick up uh, the second print that's coming out because I think it's sold out pretty much everywhere. Um, uh, definitely do it and definitely hop on for the rest of that series coming up, uh, as well as Catwoman twenty three. That's also sold out everywhere, but I know that they're releasing a a uh, second print of that, and then coming up is issue twenty four. So oh, wow, yeah. That's my, that's my new uh, comics recommendation. I'm going to leave it without any back issues this time. Perfect. So last week was absolute dog shit when it came to new comic books. I was uh, I was I was <laughs> depressed after it. I was like, there's nothing here but kill lock. But this week we've got a lot better. Obviously, Phantom X has been talked about. I did mention Batman '96 being a high point of Joker War so far. Deceased Dead Planet number two. Deceased is the oh. best corner of the DC universe in my opinion. I love it. It is. It's, it's, it's like a step above White Knight right now. They're both like they're up there. 
They're Let's do a. The, we need to do a video on deceased. I want to talk with you about deceased because I love that series. I love those books so much. All right, we, we, we can probably do that. I gotta have. There's no news coming out with the comic book industry if nobody's noticed that. I can. Nope. There's nothing to talk about, so we certainly have the time for that one. And also, Blade Runner 2019 number eight came out. Of, I'm digging that series. It's so good. And uh, so those are my recommendations this week. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, you were all so generous with your time, generous with with the the super chats. And I think we had a great conversation here. A lot of a uh, lot of fun things happened. We were it was a popping conversation. Salamat, Poe, everybody. And I'm out. Later, y'all.